on the Eastern Front, the Nazi troops were in retreat. Total mobilization, carried out in Germany to compensate for the reduced quality of divisions by their quantitative increase, did not justify itself. Hitler's attempts to carry out during the summer offensive in the East in order to regain lost ground and take Moscow were a complete failure. At Kursk, two main offensive German groups were defeated. Going on the counter-offensive, the Soviet troops put before the inevitable catastrophe of the entire German fascist army. The latter lost finally and irrevocably lost the initiative, the ability to conduct offensive actions on a large scale, which meant that Germany lost the war. The Red Army every day received a new, more advanced combat equipment. As a result of successful operations near Volgad and Kursk, a huge Soviet territory was liberated. These successes had a particularly favorable effect on the development of the resistance movement in Hitler-occupied countries, including Bulgaria. After the death of Tsar Boris, Bulgaria was ruled by regents. From these regents, as well as from some changes in the composition of the government, a change of political course could not be expected. The Bulgarian fascists became increasingly close to Hitler and his gang. The burden of the burden of this bargain fell on the shoulders of the people, on the shoulders of the working class. The already brutal exploitation of the working people increased, and their economic situation became more and more gloomy and hungry days came for our country. The fascists reduced the rations of workers and employees. Bread became worse than ever. The last products, which were still appearing in some places, disappeared from the market. Its intent of the masses was growing. Passive resistance everywhere turned into armed battles. Every bush, every tree and every stone was shooting at the fascists. They were threatened everywhere. We have begun decisive action, said Comrade Zivkov. All those threatened with arrest must immediately go to the detachments. Think of winter. It will bring a number of troubles, but they can be less if you take measures in advance. How are your dugouts? he asked. We have no dugouts, and we are not going to tear them away. The people will shelter better than the deepest dugout. That's right. If your plan can be realized, you have done well in protecting the interests of the people of Okoli. You have spared the people from requisitions. Therefore, you can expect full support. We can help you with warm clothes, shoes, count on coats, sweaters, socks, and medicines. All this, of course, will be in limited quantities but it will still meet your needs to some extent. Get ready to deploy your unit by spring. The party and the army M's will mobilize. It is necessary to think about it already now. Our conversation lasted about two hours. During this time, all the issues on the agenda were discussed in detail. I was satisfied with our conversation, and I assume that Comrade Yanko was satisfied as well. Leaving Sofia, I led a new group of comrades to the detachment. They were Kristan Kristanov, Vasil Karalambiev, Stoyan Boyanov, Panayot Banzdiv, Getso Nedelchev, Visa Gilabova Rilka Borisova, a comrade from Yugoslavia whom I had found through the password given to me by Smajevich. Delcho, having arrived in Sofia after me, stayed behind to organize the delivery to the detachment of the clothes and other materials promised by Comrade Zipkov. The instructions of Asen, Kati, and Yanko were decisive in our further political and combat activities. Upon my return to the detachment, my first task was to inform everyone about the events of international and internal life, to bring the instructions of the party and the RMs to fulfillment. In their speeches after the report, the fighters and commanders approved in general, the party line calling for an active struggle, and made proposals for new combat and political actions. Hmm. Comrades, hmm, said Todor M. Ladinov. The fire of the struggle must burn brighter and stronger. From the words of the commander, it is clear that it is necessary to expand the scope of action of the detachment. So far, we have been operating more in the Trina district, but at many meetings held with party and RMS members in the villages of Bresniki Okolia, the comrades expressed their ardent desire for the unit to operate in their places as well. Fascists are entrenched in this region. They are terrorizing the population. It is necessary to teach them a lesson. Besides, the appearance of the detachment will arouse the enthusiasm of the people. I propose to go to Bresniki district in the near future and shake the enemies there. After Todor, Bonka took the floor. She stood up, raised her head, looked somewhere in the distance, as she often did, and began eager. I, comrades, want to take revenge as soon as possible on Stefan, Bojan, and Violator. Send me to whatever risk you please, 
but only as soon as possible. I have a thirst for revenge burning in my heart. My rifle hasn't fired in a long time. My eye hasn't taken in the sight of the enemy in a long time. I urge all Rem sisters to be in the front ranks of the fighters. Bonker's speech aroused enthusiasm among the youth. She was followed by Iljo, Strahil, and Ogmjan. They unanimously insisted on meeting the enemy. In those September days, the first party meeting was held. They formed the party organization, discussed the tasks it had to solve, elected the secretary of the organization. The comrades unanimously voted for Stoyan Boyanov. Although he was young, he had a mature judgment and was loved by the comrades. At the same time, a Remsist organization was formed. Rilke Borisova, a young partisan recommended from Sofia, was assigned to head it. According to the instructions of Arsen, Katie and Jaiko, the party organizations had no right to discuss the commander's orders. Party members were to follow the orders and instructions of the commanders unconditionally, accurately and in a timely manner, to be an example and a model of discipline, to go first into battle, not to show hesitation or weakness, to hold firm in difficult moments. Now with two organizations and the command became easier to conduct the work. From that moment, the fighter was responsible not only to the commander, but also to the party, to the AMS, and this had a positive impact on the quality of our organizational and political work in the detachment. Having armed our partisans, having familiarized them with the basic rules and laws of the partisan struggle, we drew up a combat training plan and appointed Zlatan in charge of this work. The plan provided for training of individual fighters, squads, and the whole unit. The squad was divided into squads. Each squad was headed by a commander and a political delegate. The first was responsible for the combat training of the squad, the second for the supply of fighters and for political education. A few days in the area of the village of Kalna held classes on formation and firearms training were shown the organization of various types of ambushes, blocking individual houses and sections of the village, reconnaissance and guarding. The fighters became more fit familiarized with a number of tactical techniques of guerrilla warfare. Here we met Slavcho Redomiski and Violator Jakova. Slavcho, a furrier by profession, was short gaunt and hardened in the revolutionary struggle. He had already spent several years in prison, and after his release he was an organizer of militant groups in Sofia, participating in a number of sabotage actions. Slavcho was known as a brave and loyal comrade. The district committee sent him to our unit. For some time, Slavcho got acquainted with the organization of the detachment, studied the experience, so that later he could set up a detachment in Radomir Okulis. He had to report on the results of his work to us, as he also received assignments from us. On the same terms came to us comrades Kristen Kristanov from Sofia I. Okolitsa and Tudor Madenov from Brezniki Okolitsa. In this way, we prepared the commanders of the future Radomir, Breznik, and Shopa units, whose origins came from the Trinsky unit. We had never heard of Violeta Jakova before. She resembled Slavcho Radomiski in many ways. Like him, she was short, thin, and brave. Although she was young, she endured many hardships in her life. She worked as a seamstress, then in a... The police never left her without attention. None of us could have guessed at that time that this fragile creature hid the greatest strength, that this weak-looking, thin girl was the future heroine of the squad. At the squad meeting, we analyzed the battle at Janikovichok. It was necessary to evaluate the battle, to learn from its successes and blunders. It was necessary to familiarize both new partisans and future detachment commanders with the tactics of the battle. All unanimously condemned the underestimation of the combat guard, insisted on strict compliance with the rules of guerrilla warfare. Care about the safety of the detachment under any circumstances was declared the most sacred duty of every soldier and commander. Fair criticism of comrades who made the noted blunders helped to further increase vigilance and demanding in the detachment. As a result of active activity of the detachment, till the end of October we not only compensated the losses incurred on Yanikova Chuk, but also to a great extent increased our fighting ability. Every one of us had received a baptism of fire, had thoroughly familiarized ourselves with the political situation, and could talk freely with the peasants on any topical issues. The villagers, for their part, got to know us better and saw us as their defenders. If in the beginning we relied on individual yataks, now we had a mass base. Our struggle had entered its highest phase. Individual yataks during this period performed special tasks. 
They conducted reconnaissance, sheltered wounded and free partisans, and led combat group. Feeding us ceased to be a problem. We received food not from individual members of the party or the RMS, not from our Yataks, but from the entire population, and first of all from the most affluent peasants. They were in a position not only to feed us better, but also to provide us with clothes and lend us money. When the police became aware that it was not the poor but the rich who were accepting us, they persecuted them and thus embittered them and turned them against the authorities. We were now able to blockade an entire village and establish our own order there in relative peace. The cases of treachery decreased. Many headmen, their deputies and other administrative officials themselves offered us their services in the struggle against the authorities. The fact that from the very beginning we punished the vicious fascists and people saw by example that those guilty before the partisans and the people could not escape retribution, no matter how hard they tried, prevented many fires, saved many of our Yateks from being sh The enemy knew, we do not forgive cruelty, we seize and punish the guilty. In case of financial difficulties we resorted to borrowing, mainly turning to rich people and giving them promissory notes. The population treated us with trust and people offered their help without any fear. Thanks to our closed ties with the population, we knew everything that was said in the villages, even in face-to-face -face conversations, we knew who had weapons and where they were hidden. We also had a great impact on the administrative apparatus. In the territories of Greece and Yugoslavia occupied by the Bulgarian fascist authorities, some people from the Tringi region worked as administrative employees. To many of them, those whom we managed to find, letters were sent through their homes warning them to leave the occupied territory within five days. As a result, those who had been warned returned home within the time limit given to them. In this way, we also helped the enslaved Greek and Yugoslav peoples in their struggle against the common enemy, fascism. With our consent, the headmen of the Strezimirov, Filipov and Vukan communities remained on duty, while the headman of the Leverekenskaya community Dimitar, Peeve was later warned to leave the community at 24 hours. He carried out our order with great precision. All these actions raised the authority of our detachment even higher. Now the authorities in the villages did not turn to the Okai governor for instructions, but to the leadership of the detachment. The killed partisans became a banner of struggle for the population. The song about Stefan and Veljo was sung by the people in the villages. With this song, the shepherds went to the pastures in the morning and the reapers returned from the fields in the evening. The simple melody, in the spirit of folk tunes, was heard everywhere. This song became a favourite in the Trinsk, Bresnik and Radomir regions. It was also sung by Yugoslav young men and women who knew our partisans. Simply without embellishment, this song told about the battle on Janikova Chuck. In the mouths of the partisans, it sounded like a threat and an... We'll sacrifice hundreds but we'll defeat fascism. The hard, bloody struggle will be illuminated by freedom. With Slavsho Radomirsky, we clarified some details in connection with his forthcoming activities. He and Rilke Borisova left for Radomirsky Okoli. I accompanied them to the village of Vidra. From there, they had to get there on their own. The road to Vidra passed through the village of Upper Melna. Passing by the house of the blacksmith Strati Gigov, I remembered about the rifle and suggested Slavsho to come for it. The blacksmith met me kindly this time too, though I felt that his courtesy was dictated by a wait-and-see tactic and not by cordiality, I decided to be kind too. Budimka, he called to his wife, prepared dinner for the guests. Find something there, milk, brinza, whatever God has given you? I will, Aunt Budimka answered obediently, leaving the room. Hmm, Uncle Strati, do you know why we've come? Hey, slaps your nephew. The blacksmith squinted cunningly. If I don't know, you tell me. I'll have bread, Brinzoka, too. I won't let you go hungry. That's not the point. Uncle Strati, we've come for the rifle. What rifle? The man got worried. It's my enemies, my jealous neighbors, who are clobbering you. He cursed at those he suspected of denouncing him. He forgot that we heard about the rifle from his own mouth a month and a half ago. I love you as if you were my own children. But can you think that if I had a gun, I wouldn't give it to you? No matter how much we persuaded him to give up the rifle voluntarily, the blacksmith stubbornly refused that he had a gun and swore by all his four children to prove his words. There was nothing left but to find the rifle ourselves. A wooden staircase led to the upper floor. There were doors to the left and right leading out of the small living room. 
I opened the left door and shone the light. The coat rack was behind the door. Immediately in the light of my pocket flashlight, I saw a new Serbian carbine hanging on a new belt. Miss Lavcho, this was sent to me as a present by my Vaser, your best friend. I thought you were asking about some other gun. Me, the blacksmith, humoured me. Where are the cartridges? Miss Lavcho, there are no cartridges. He answered embarrassed and grabbed his moustache in confusion. Don't be crooked, Uncle Strutty. Vasil could not have given you a carbine without cartridges. You're only so generous in words. No, so that Vasil would die on the spot if I lied. He swore an oath and crossed himself to make it more convincing. I'll have to look for it, but if I find it... It's unnecessary, slave. I have no ammunition. I did not believe this assurance either and went to the right room. There was a large iron bed, covered with a homespun woolen blanket of bright red, yellow and green squares. I lifted the coverlet, and there was a box under the bed. It was quite heavy. What's in this box, Uncle Strati? Are there nails in it? Sir, the blacksmith, frowning, was silent. He wagged his eyes slowly, looking at one wall or the other, avoiding to meet our gaze, and, without knowing why, fumbled in one pocket or the other. You're trembling, Slavjo Radomowski broke the heavy silence. You must be expecting a firing squad. You deserve it, but... I'm saving all this for Vasco, by God, for Vasco. I know he'll come to you too. Of course, Vasco never thought of going to the partisans. He was serving his superiors in the village of Govidarci, wrote his father enthusiastic letters about the German army, and waited impatiently for his promotion to the next rank. We parted with Slavcho and Varia. I stayed in the village of Vidra at Mita Stanimirov to contact through him Georgi Vasilev from the village of Dokjavitsi, whom I knew as a good comrade. He was a bricklayer and had participated in a number of illegal meetings in Sofia. At the same time, he gave the impression of a man with no courage, which did not fit in with his powerful, solidly built figure. There were old communists in both Vidra and Dokjavitsi, but party work in these villages had been stagnant for some time. Now these people, one by one, began to express their readiness to get involved in the work, which meant that they were ready to host partisans, to help in reconnaissance if necessary, to lead party agitation, to agitate for the home front, for victory. I was tempted to go to Dokiovis, not only by the prospect of re-establishing the party organisation, but also by the hope of meeting here one of the most popular farmers of the district, Ivan Yotsov. Therefore, after the party meeting I did not leave, but decided to stay at Georgie's house in order to see the farmer the next day. The meeting, however, did not take place, having decided, probably, that they wanted to bring him to work or at least have a conversation with him. Ivan Yotsov disappeared from the village in a flash. We are already used to such numbers. You come somewhere, wait all day, and in the end, nothing. It was getting dusk when a rifle shot rang out not far from Georgi Vasilev's house. This circumstance greatly alarmed my host. He assumed that someone had learned of my presence and began to urge me to leave as quickly as possible. I, on the contrary, was not disturbed by the shot, but I agreed to go. After all, he knew the people and the situation in his native village better than I did. Georgie led me along the river. We walked along the bank for a long time until the village was left behind. Here he showed me the way to Upper Melna and we parted ways. I followed the path he showed me, not daring to turn aside to avoid going astray. In the darkness I wandered into a gully so thick with thorns that I could hardly get out. Then I thought that, frightened as he was, Georgius had only dreamed of getting rid of me as soon as possible and had not thought of what might happen to me. And in fact there was no reason to run away. The assistant mayor got drunk and decided to have some fun. But how? He took a rifle and shot and wounded himself. It's a well-known fact that his relatives shouted and screamed. All Georgie had to do was to keep his cool. He got to Upper Melna. There had been a party group here for a long time. I contacted the secretary of the group and called a meeting. Six or seven people were present, among them brothers Mile and Liko from Palilula Mahala. At the meeting I invited the communists and through them the non-partisans to join the unit. But no one was willing. If Milan, a teacher ran away from the village to Sofia to avoid joining the partisans, said one of those present. What can we take from him? He is single, and we have a dozen children on our necks. And the man went to get married. Another one interceded. He can't be single forever. And that's a great concern, too. It's time to get married. People are dying for us, and he's getting married, 
said the first one angrily. Eh? One gets married in times of peace, the other in times of trouble. Milan did go to Sophia. Some said that he had run away to avoid joining the partisans, others that he had found a rich bride and fearing to lose the dowry had left immediately, but most likely it was both. The reason did not matter to us. What mattered to us was that he had left without informing his comrades and had thus violated party discipline. In vain we waited for his return. Milan remained in Sofia and received a party reprimand. The failures of Hitler's army on the Eastern Front and in Africa forced the German ogres to increase the pressure on the Sofia regents, demanding that Bulgarian troops be sent against the Soviet Union. The lackeys Filov, Prince Kirill and Mihov launched extensive agitation and propaganda in favour of fascist Germany. They tried to convince the Bulgarian workers and peasants that the German fascists were their brothers and that the Soviet people were their worst enemies. There was nothing to which the Bulgarians were as sensitive as friendship with the Soviet people. Therefore, when the fascists began to fraternise with the Hitlerites and scientists, were found who depicted us as almost cousins of the Japanese and, thus joining us to the pure race, began to agitate us to go against our own brothers. The Soviet workers and peasants, the whole country rose up against the government. The Bulgarian people will never betray this friendship, cemented by brotherly blood in a brutal war. To fight the attempt of the fascists to throw the Bulgarian army against the Soviet country, the Bulgarian Labour Party raised all patriotic forces. In October it addressed the army with a proclamation which spoke of the impending danger. The proclamation was addressed to officers, non-commissioned officers and soldiers. This proclamation stated that Hitler, sensing his end, wanted to sink in blood the Bulgarian people whose army he needed not only to break the resistance of other nations fighting for freedom and independence, but also to fight the Red Army. Who is not clear, the document said, that Hitler has lost the war. Who is not clear that victory is on the side of the Soviet Union and its allies? Who is not clear that after the end of the war Hitler and his allies will have to answer for their crimes? We are sounding the alarm, Bulgaria is in danger. The proclamation ended with slogans calling for the expulsion of the Germans from our country, the breaking of the axis that binds the German fascists to the fascist government of Bulgaria, and the establishment of a people's democratic government, and for close friendship and cooperation with the Soviet Union and the peoples of the Balkan countries, for a free, independent and happy Bulgaria. The slogans read, in connection with the call of the party, the detachment paid exceptional attention to mass political work. At meetings in the villages, we talked about the long-standing Bulgarian-Russian friendship, born in the War of Liberation, which put an end to the 500 years of the Turkish yoke. We explained to the people to what grave consequences for Bulgaria and the Bulgarian people would lead to the use of our army against the Soviet Union. We agitated the peasants to appeal to their sons who were in the occupation forces in Yugoslavia, Greece, Macedonia to leave the army and go over to the side of the partisans. In mid-October, the police launched a major action against the partisans. It was designed to cover a large area that included the villages of Kalna, Krofina, Jabuka, Rakov Dol, Radosin and Preslop. The police launched two simultaneous counter-strikes, one from Pirate and the other from Trien. The operation was led by the notoriously brutal thug Kocho Stoyanov, who had 4,000 police and soldiers under his command. In the area where the strikes were carried out, a detachment of Zivojin Nikolic operated T. Bibroko was one of the most popular figures of the resistance in the Kronotrava district. He was a mighty big man with a thick, fluffy moustache because of which he received his nickname. Having discovered the location of his detachment in the village of Rakov Dol, the fascists fired all kinds of weapons at the village and began to surround it. Only through skillful manoeuvring, Brico took the detachment out of the police attack. Enraged by the failure, the thug Stoyanov ordered his obedient servants, officers Dikov, Kitov, Apostolov, Dinev and Karaivanov, to burn all the villages in the area on October 25, and to arrest men under 50 and send them to forced labour in central Bulgaria. On the morning of the day appointed by the executioner, fires broke out simultaneously in ten villages. Houses, outbuildings, barns, everything was engulfed in flames and a glow stood over the villages, symbolising both the strength and weakness of the fascist power. The whole neighbourhood was covered with smoke, smelled of cinders. Like the Huns, people fled in panic, children were crying, Cattle were roaring wildly in the flaming cowsheds. Many peasants went mad that day, many prematurely greyed. 
The fascists expected that the terror would make the people fall to their knees and stop resisting. The cruelty, which left hundreds of families homeless, deprived of everything, further inflamed the hatred of the inhabitants of villages and hamlets, intensified the partisan struggle. Now there was nothing to keep people in the villages. Not only adults, but also children went to the partisan detachments. November came cold and rainy. The Gerilis's clothes were worn out, however. New clothes did not save us from the rain and cold. And just at this time, the detachment received the promised leather jackets, fur hats, sweaters, and woolen socks. All this was sent through by Tosho, the miller, as had been arranged during my last stay in Sofia. He had a truck and was often in the capital. We also received some things through Stoyan Yakimov, an agronomist from Trine. These things were collected by the communists of the town. This concern of the party, shown just before the operation at the Zeta mine, long conceived by us, touched the fighters, for the action they were preparing carefully. The object was very serious. It required good preparation and organization, accuracy and suddenness of action. Proceeding from this, for several days, near Kalni combat exercises were intensively conducted. At the same time, due to the cold weather, measures were taken for physical hardening. Day and night the soldiers were in the open air. We learned to determine the time of moonrise and moonset, the appearance of the morning star, the position of the Big Dipper, the distance from it to the Little Dipper. We admired bright sunrises and flaming sunsets. The sky was indeed unspeakably beautiful when the sun was hiding in the clouds. They were coloured then in golden, then in silver colour, then became transparent, then suddenly thickened, iridescently shimmering. Nature was an ocean of colours. Every leaf, every blade of grass was painted in bright sunny colours. But all this did not warm up. That's why in these cold November days we were so impatiently waiting for the sunrise, gathered where its first rays fell, simultaneously warming and entertaining us, and in the evenings we saw it off with a sigh of regret. Wonderful sunsets. Sometimes they looked like a huge fire that engulfed not only the mountains with their pointed peaks, but also the sky, the whole boundless horizon. By sunsets we learned to predict the weather, a red sunset heralded wind and storm, a sunset in the clouds, rain. We preferred clear sunsets when the sun was visible until the last moment before going behind the mountains. Such a sunset promised a weather day of Indian summer. Here and there we lit fires. We warmed our stiff hands by the fire, Sometimes we cooked beans or meat we had received from the helpful people of Kalna. They spared neither bread nor cattle for us. Despite the fact that the fascist authorities deprived them of all supplies, that they did not receive sugar, rice, kerosene, soap, people found a way to get us everything we needed. Don't starve them, they said. The inhabitants of the Kalnini villages of Strain and Vinishte were always among us. They took it upon themselves to deliver us food, wash our laundry and help us in reconnaissance. Already the old Baje Savo, his elder son Velichko, the agile Nikola and the cunning Vaiden worked round the clock for us, and this work was much harder than that which fell to the share of the partisans themselves. Only when some of them left their house, others would come to take their place, others would take them away, others would come, and often the police would come to them and beat them severely, take everything in the house and leave. There were cases when they were taken to try and kept in custody for several days, but, having achieved nothing, were released. We rejoiced with joy. These people knew how to stand up to the enemy, when necessary, courageously and adamantly, and when pretending to be simpletons, but they always returned to their own. After the training in the forest of Kalna, Dencho's detachment went to Kreshta, and I stayed in Kalna to wait for the return of Delcho and the group of Zlatan and Todor Madinov, which was still in Bresnik and Saribrod Okoliyi. Delcho was in Sofia, and we were expecting him with the new partisans from day to day. Zaitan and Tador were delayed in the area more than expected, and this worried us greatly. It happened that both groups showed up at Kalna on the same day. Three new partisans came with Delcho Esvivin Veselinov from Pernik, Georgi Lazarov and Trako Maktonsky. At the same time, Petko also returned from the border. He found his brother Nidyolko and brought him with him. Both groups, including the new comrades, numbered 14 men, of whom only eight were well armed. My meeting with Densho was scheduled to take place in the neighborhood of Upper Melna. On the way, passing by Glavanovs, we decided to attack the police station. We knew that there were many police in the village, and it was not in our plans to get into a fight. We only wanted to tease the enemy. 
We waded across the Irma River and came to the station we had already attacked in June of this year. We silently swung over the wattle surrounding the vegetable garden and lay down in a ditch on the left side of the highway tri Enyi Havanitsi. Realizing that the slightest rustle could ruin our plan, I gave the order to observe the strictest silence. Set the head of the small column Crawd's Latan, Mito Tau, Reiko's brother, Kristan, and Christjo from Yaroslavets. They made up the assault group that was to attack first. After crawling a few steps, they stopped and stood for a long time. This aroused the resentment of the comrades following them, who were worried that time was running out and the enemy might discover us. An hour passed, the assault group crawled close to the sentry, the partisans opened fire, let him through a grenade. The policemen managed to run into the courtyard where six other men were sleeping. When they heard the explosion, they rushed across the field to the nearest pine forest, a hundred meters from the school, where the police company was stationed. The police officers who had fled from the station opened fire only when they reached the woods. Some time later, the police officers who were in the school also opened fire. They thought they were being fired upon by guerrillas from the forest and concentrated all their fire against their... Seeing that the gap had been reached, we withdrew. Later we learned that the shooting continued all night. Neither the policemen from the station nor those at the school could understand for a long time what was going on. Both thought they were dealing with guerrillas who had attacked them. This third consecutive attack on Hadovsi threw the police into great anxiety. The police thought now not of attacking, but only of defence, for which purpose more secure shelters were built around the school. After meeting with the squad, the headquarters drew up a detailed plan of attack on the mine. We did not know the composition of the guards, so we decided to make one or two forays into an area remote from the mine in order to divert the attention of the police and then hit the main facility. This tactic had been tried and tested many times and had produced good results. For this purpose, we targeted the village of Boshitsa, Barsiligrad district, and the villages of Shipkovitsa and Dragoichintsi, located 8 to 10 kilometers from the mine. We had never been to these villages before, and they were completely unfamiliar to us. On the way to Bozhitsa, the night caught us in the area of the mountain Kivav Kaimik, rising about 1,700 meters above sea level. It snowed during the night and the ground immediately turned white. Our clothes were covered with snow. It got cold. We built fires, threw dry branches around and lay down, thus saving ourselves from cold. However, it was impossible to sleep. While you warm your chest by the fire, your back would freeze. Oh, comrades, you can't sleep like this. Hmm complained Densho, who could sleep under any circumstances and in any position. Come on, let's get warm. He took his harmonica, which he never parted with, and played the Trinian Koro. If comrade Densho can't sleep, said Ognian, it must be a good frost. He immediately jumped up. The others got up after him. The Koro shook. Besides the fact that Densho could fall asleep unusually fast, he had two other weaknesses. He snored loudly in his sleep, and in his spare time he dismantled his watch to its screws. Once, when we were sleeping in Grandma Satter's hayloft in Slizos, children were playing right next to us. As long as they were playing downstairs, we were in no danger of being discovered. But when they decided to climb an apple tree, whose branches reached the roof of the hayloft, both Stefan and I were afraid. Densho was asleep and snoring so loudly that the children could not help hearing him. If I hadn't covered his mouth with my hand, they would have discovered us and we would have had to leave our hiding place in broad daylight. Densho's watch didn't work for more than a week or two. Whenever I returned from Sofia, I brought him a watch, and always he was without a watch. He would take it apart, put it back together, then take it apart again, and fiddle with it until it stopped in his hands forever. Along with these forgivable weaknesses, Densho possessed many enviable qualities. Sociable and cheerful, he quickly captured the hearts of his comrades. He was equally loved by both young and old partisans. He found something to talk about with everyone. He enjoyed great authority in the detachment and was a favourite commander. Brave, loyal, resourceful and fair. This is how he was brought up by our glorious RMs. Thanks to him this cold night passed unnoticed. When the first winter day came, snow covered the leaves of the trees. The branches bowed under the weight of the snow. The grass was covered with snow. Santa Claus came into his rights. We left the forest early and headed through a wide meadow. On the virgin snow we could see the tracks of our sentinel, who had just made his way through the deep drifts. 
nor could the border furrow be seen, and it, which had been hated by the people of this region for decades, lay somewhere under the snow. Why did you come back? Densho asked Petko, who was part of the patrol. We saw peasants with a horse, he reported. How many? No. Clap them and ask where they're coming from and where they're going. Petko saluted and ran to carry out the order. The peasants were from Lysina Mahala in Boshitsa village. They were carrying cabbage. We went along with them, and by eight o'clock in the evening we arrived at the Mahala. Immediately we sent scouts to the village, but unfavourable information forced us to cancel the attack on the post office. We returned back. Not far from Shipkovitsa, Kristan and I left the detachment to meet Slavcho Radomiski at the agreed place, while the detachment went to the village to return the requisitioned grain to the peasants, which had already been collected and could be taken to the city at any moment. Kristen had to go to his neighbourhood, but his participation in some operations was necessary. He was gaining combat experience. The news of the squad's arrival in Shipkovitsa spread throughout the village. A crowd gathered in the square, some were brought here by their love for the partisans, others were overcome by curiosity. The police were rarely here. The village was far from the city, all roads to it led through the forest, and the enemies, fearing a sudden attack of the partisans, were afraid to show themselves here. Therefore, both the partisans and the population felt relatively calm. When the whole village was gathered, Densho informed the guerrillas of the purpose of their arrival and instructed one of the fighters to break the doors of the warehouse where the grain taken from the population was stored. Did you take the sacks with you? Densho asked the peasants. This is your grain. It was taken from you and we're giving it back to you. Are you happy? How can't we be happy? There are people who want to help us too to protect us, said a man's voice from the crowd. Long live the partisans, shouted another and hundreds of voices echoed the slogan. The peasants had come to the square without sacks and did not seem ready to sort out the grain. So Densho addressed them again. Hmm, why don't you good people carry your sacks? But no sooner had the door of the warehouse been opened than, to everyone's surprise, dozens of sacks appeared in their hands. Oh, go to see everyone should take as much as they have taken from him, urged the same voice that had just proclaimed the slogan. Oh, whoever takes more will never have a good fortune. Hmm shouted the old woman. I am for the truth. And we are for truth, grandmother. Densho answered. We know, we know. If you are not for the truth, you would not be on this road. Amrat Densho. Baizakari called out. Shall we distribute all the grain? What about it? It would be good to set some of it on fire. Hmm. The latter suggested. So that tomorrow the peasants would have a reason to say that the grain was burnt. Otherwise, it will be taken from them again. Hmm, that's reasonable. Good, Zacharias, you've got a good head. Not without reason you are an old bachelor, Gencho said half-jokingly, half-seriously, and pointed out the place where they should burn a hundred kilograms of oats. Satisfied with this turn of affairs, the peasants gave us a rich dinner. The children were also gathered. Densho gave them pencils, rubber bands, and from the most courageous organized the first children's fighting group. He gave the children the tasks, everything they learn about the police and troops, to report to their older comrades. This task the children performed perfectly. When the party meeting with the peasants was over, the detachment went to Dragoikinsi, a large village in the mountains, badly disposed towards the partisans. Here the fascists managed to consolidate the community and set up their own organization with a large number of armed adherents. The influence of our party here was insignificant. There was not a single person with whom we kept in touch. The attachment made a march to Dragojitnesi with two goals. First, to set fire to the building of the community, and second, to find honest people to rely on for future work. The first goal was achieved, and the comrades acquired twelve rifles and many cartridges. But the second goal remained unrealized. It was necessary to find other ways to reach the inhabitants of Dragojitnesi. The meeting with Slavcho Radomirsky and Rilka Boriseva took place on a high peak, east of the village of Vernyak Melna. This is where the detachment came to. Only Ivanka was missing. She was ill and Densho left her with Bai Costa, our Yatak from the village of Nishnya. What can you do? A partisans are living people, and sometimes illness overtakes them. We had the joy of a successful operation of the detachment and rich trophies. 
Only in Dragojicinci we managed to take twelve rifles. The last actions of the detachment infuriated the enemies. The police, as we had expected, moved all their forces to the area of the villages of Shipkovica and Dragoji Sea. At the same time we were approaching the Zlata mine, and from our camp to the mine was now no more than one crossing. During the night it snowed again. The roads were soaked and the guerrillas' clothes were soaked. Passing through the pop of Dol Mahala in the village of Goroshevsi, Dencho and I went for news to Bainako, whom Peter Stanimirov had recently introduced us to. This man did not inspire me with confidence at first. I feel he was always worrying about his family and his house. I wanted to send him to the devils together with the house, but I tolerated it, hoping that he would come to his senses. This time he met us cordially. There was no longer the fear in him that I remembered. As far as his knowledge extended, there were no police in the surrounding villages, which required that we should not hesitate to attack while the police were away from our object. On our way to the mine we were to pass through the village of Errol and take Bar Basil with us. He was at his home. As a worker at the mine, Bar Basil knew his location well. He knew where the guards were, the telephone, the directorate, the cashier's office where the administration lived. In a word, everything we were interested in. With his help we made a plan, and when we approached the mine we stopped for a while and I familiarised each fighter with the plan. Apart from the usual guards, there were no other guards at the mine. The suddenness of the attack helped to bring the action to a quite successful conclusion. The five policemen guarding the mine were disarmed and locked in the guardhouse. Large trophies were taken from the mine, including three horses, 170,000 livres in money, a typewriter paper, gold and silver proofs, five rifles, five pistols, and plenty of ammunition. When the night shift workers learned that the partisans had come, they left their work and surrounded us. They wanted to hear the news from us. They listened attentively, absorbing every word like blotting paper absorbs ink. We intended to disable the machines as well. But the workers did not agree. They believed that if the machines stopped, they would be fired, which would lead to hunger and more poverty for them and their families. Even though we were of a different opinion, it was decided not to touch the machines so as not to cause discontent among the workers. The grocery store where the workers got their food also continued to function. The workers saw us off with enthusiastic cries of don't forget us. Come back. After the actions in Dragojixi and at the mines later, the detachment had a surplus of weapons, even a stockpile. It was necessary to secure this surplus. Leave it with me. Mm. Offered by Vasil. Hey, and I just wanted to address you. Long life and good health to you, by Vasil. I shook his hand firmly, rejoicing at the change in him, and by Vasil wept. You won't be happy when my corner is burned down by the police chief coacher by Kushev, will you? Having calmed down, he jokingly asked. Now you and I have the same fate. Dead or alive, we must win. By Vasil thought for a moment. Nothing was dearer to him than the party and now he was ready to take another great risk for its sake. But here are the children they are, except Apesho and Mancho, all little ones. But Bai Vazil decided to help us because he knew that we could not go on living like this. Or maybe he had a premonition that the path he had chosen would not last long. That victory was near. From Ariel the detachment moved to Jelavis Mountain. Here there were vast forests which could not be traversed in a few days. The snow had melted in some places, which allowed us to hide our tracks better. On this day my comrades slept, and this was not often possible for partisans, because they were always on their feet, always on the alert. They found time to write letters to their homes. They wrote to Strahil, Bonka, Lina, Vancho, only the gloomy Bytrico sat aside, barely restraining his deep sighs. This marvellous Danka was no longer alive, and September 7, we sent her, wounded, to Sophia for treatment. Instead of helping her, the scoundrel doctor rushed to hand her over to the police. Danka was arrested and killed. Everyone was shocked by the meanness of the doctor, a humanist who had sworn to help people in all circumstances. An orphan child, something he is now doing in Sofia. In the evening, when we began to pack for the road, comrades reported that two, including Deputy Commissioner Strahil, disappeared from the detachment. I did not worry about them, certain that they had wandered off somewhere in the forest, and we did not wait for them. In any case, they must have come to Kauna, since Strahil knew the detachment's route. So they did. They went to look for water, and having lost their way, came to the house of the Leshnikov priest. 
The whole day the partisans spent at his place, he fed them, gave them a leather jacket, socks, money, and showed them the way to Kalna. The next day they found us. The next halt we made was at Bokov. It was midnight. Everyone in the village was asleep. We had to hide our belongings, which were loaded on three horses, and we had also left a hectograph, medicines and weapons with Aunt Boshana. Now we had to take them all out and hide them somewhere else, in order to confuse the police, if they managed to get wind of anything. We did not leave all our equipment in one place, and now we also hid part of our luggage at Luba's, Aunt Boshana's neighbour, part in Mito Tamuf's hayloft, and the hectograph in the hayloft of our neighbour, Grandfather Dimitraki. We notified only Luba. She had no hayloft, and we could not leave anything without her knowledge. We hid everything else without informing the owners. We expected to return soon and rehide the property. Only Dencho and I knew about the hiding places. Delcho was back in Sofia at that time. The news of the action at the mine came to Kalna before we did. In the Mahals of Strain and Venitsa we were given a cordial welcome. The detachment entered the village having already several good horses, and the white colour of two of them gave our modest entry a solemn appearance. The presence of horses in our possession gave rise to the legend of partisan cavalry. In reports to their Sofia chiefs, Dragulov and Baikushev reported that the Shumians already had cavalry. On this basis they demanded that a cavalry unit and motorcycles be placed at the disposal of the police, regardless of what purpose the Tringi rulers had in making up the falsehoods. The legend of the non-existent cavalry spread from village to village, from Okolia to Okolia, increasing the fame of the detachment. During these days, the Yugoslav partisans brought to us in Kana, a group of Bulgarian soldiers taken prisoner by them under different circumstances. We organized a good meeting for them, and the first duty was to agitate them to stay with us. Some accepted our offer, others refused. We released those who did not want to join the partisans. We gave them money for the road, provided them with tables and sent them with an escort to the automobile stop so that they could go home. Those who stayed behind were solemnly welcomed into the detachment. The new partisans took the oath before the fighters and before the inhabitants of the nearby villages. This happened on the eve of the action in the village of Miloslavsi, located seven or eight kilometers from Kalni. Miloslavsi is one of the few villages in Okoya in which the partisans have not yet had to visit. Therefore, after the action at the mine Zlata, the first thing we did was to target the village of Milok. Here we kept in touch with only one man, Luko Rengelov, who we knew as a farmer. But so far we had not given him any special assignments, saving him for more difficult times. The operation was set for November 29. The detachment went out in full force. We left Kalna at daylight, crossed Barne at dusk, and in the darkness descended into the Zinpov somewhere above the village of Nasalepsi. They were no more than one or two kilometers to the western outskirts of Miloslavsi. This distance could be covered in about 20 minutes. We usually informed about the situation in any village in the outermost houses, and then, moving towards the center, we checked and clarified the received data. Here we did the same. The information gathered from the first people we met was favorable. No one had heard that there were any police or troops in the village. We were assured that everything was peaceful and quiet. Drahil and Ognian were sent to scout. They were not only the oldest of our partisans, but also the most experienced. It seemed that no matter how the enemy camouflaged himself, they would detect him. Strahil came to the detachment as a gymnasium student. Working as an officer in charge of a sector of the Workers' Youth Union in Sophia's Sugar Factory neighborhood, he won everyone's love and respect for his accuracy, courage, directness and sociability. He was always the first in all operations undertaken by the organization's militant group. He was the first to spread leaflets, to paste slogans calling for struggle. By his personal example, he enthralled the youth of the neighborhood, who trusted him in everything. Strahil enjoyed the same trust and love in the detachment. Together with him in the squad were his fellow Remsists, Iljo, Pesho, Nadia and Dimitar Tarkov. They were the Golden Boys, our combat vanguard. They were always the first where the fate of the squad was decided. First in reconnaissance and in battle, they were not accidentally responsible for the main areas. Strahil was the secretary of the party organization and deputy commissar of the detachment. Dimitar Tarkov's group commander and later battalion commander, secretary of the youth organization of the detachment and later battalion commissar. Strahil was also the first in this action. He was followed by Ogshan Christiolina the whole column. 
On the way, Strahil and Ognian noticed a bright light in the windows of a house and decided to find out what it could be. How were they to know that it was the house of Stefan's murderer, guard Maladainov, and that he was now Gam? None of the villagers we met knew that there was a police force in the village. She came to the village stealthily, approaching the door. Strahil knocked. A woman answered and the knockers identified themselves as partisans. The woman immediately alerted her husband. He instantly grabbed his automatic rifle and told his wife how to behave. Chewing down the steps to the first floor, she shouted, Wait, guys, I'll open the door. When she reached the door, she began to moan and lament that the key was rusty and would not unlock, delaying the time to give her husband a chance to get ready. He loaded his automatic rifle, opened a window on the second floor and fired a whole clip at Strahil and Ognian, who were standing below. When they heard the shooting, police officers stationed nearby at the school came running. Ognian managed to get away, while Strahil remained dead in front of the house. Nearby, near an old barn, Christio and Lena stood waiting. A group of policemen rushed toward them. Christio darted into the dark alleyway to look for his comrades, and before he knew it, Lena was in the hands of the police. She did not even have time to shoot. Everything happened in a matter of moments. In this environment, it was wise to retreat to Kalna. After the heroic deaths of Stefan, Velho Marin, Violator, and the tragic death of Danka, the loss of Strahil was very hard on us. A deep sorrow gripped the hearts of all. As hard as it was, we decided to notify his parents of his death and wrote them the following letter. Dear parents, you know where and why Stoyan went. He came to our Trinsky detachment, hiding from the pursuit of the dogs Gabrovsky and Doko Christoph. We did not know him, but very soon he won the hearts of all comrades and became our favourite, correctly understanding the line of the partisan struggle and actively participating in it. He was always among the first. He was inspired by a great hatred for the enemies of the people, enslavers and oppressors. We, the commanders and fighters of the detachment, swear by his memory that we will unite our ranks even more closely. We swear to avenge him, the hundreds of unforgettable comrades who died in the fierce struggle with the enemy. The day of our triumphs is near. Fascism will be defeated. Accept the battle greetings from all partisans and partisan women of the glorious Trine detachment. At the beginning of December, because our plan included the creation of partisan units in other districts, the leadership of the Trine detachment decided to send comrades to Dor Maladenov to Bresnik and Kristen Kristanov to Sofia rural districts. To assist Tador M. Ladenov, Svilom Vasilinov was assigned to work with the youth. In addition to the work assigned to them in Brezhniki Okalia, they were assigned the task of establishing communication with the miners of Perinka, who at that time were about 5,000 people. After establishing communication with them, Tador and Momshil were to organize a channel of communication with the detachment necessary for the miners who were threatened with arrest to go to the partisans. I, too, set out with them. We all walked together as far as the village of Rasnik in the Bresnik district. Kristen was the first to part with us. He went to his district. We three stayed behind so that I could connect to Dor Emladinov with the party organizations in the villages of Rasnik, Viskiara, and Mestitsa. With Kristen, we agreed to meet in a few days in Sofia. My trip to the capital was connected with a message we had just received from Tito's headquarters. We were told that the British military mission wanted to meet with us to agree on supplying the Bulgarian partisans with weapons and clothing. In addition, we were informed from Sofia that Gocho Gopin, Georgi Grigorov, and other comrades released from the concentration camp should be transferred to the detachment as soon as possible. During the time I spent in Sofia, I managed to get in touch with my acquaintances who, as I hoped, would go to the detachment without an invitation. Among them were Nako Stanikov, Anani Panov, Vera Yakimova, Dimitar Simov, Georgi Tvetvetkov, and Tufiel Simov, but except for Tufiel, all of them found a reason to refuse. Nako Stanachkov, one of the most active communists in our region, served in the bank of the town of Godik. I wrote to him and a few days later received a reply. He explained that he was ill with ulcer, and if he came to the unit he would only be a burden there. In the same spirit Anani I. Panov answered me. And Dimitri Simov said that one of their family was already a partisan and asked me to postpone his appearance in the detachment until a later time. Only Georgi Tivitkov gave me a promise that he would spend the Christmas holidays in his native village Milkyovsi, and as soon as we called him, he would come immediately. But of all the refusals, I was most distressed by a letter from Vera Yakimova, 
with whom we had been tried together and who was now out of prison. She developed a strange theory that it was too early to go to the detachment, that the partisan movement had not yet taken on a mass character, and her main argument was that the Red Army would do its work without the partisans. It was not the first time that we had to hear these opportunistic assertions. They penetrated everywhere, and especially quickly took hold of people who were ready to invent any argument to save their own skin, who did not realize that the partisan movement could become a mass movement only when the people in Massey joined it, who did not understand that the Red Army, fulfilling its great mission, can really liberate you from the fascists without our help. But what eyes will we look into the face of the Soviet people then? Each of them was also born by a mother. Each of them is dear to life. What will happen if they start to take care of themselves? All this was not difficult to understand, but some people did not want to understand because it was more profitable for them. For 10 days, from December 20 to December 30, just when I was in Sofia, the case of the communists and partisans of the Trianokali was being tried there. For six months, those arrested had been tortured in the police, forced to confess to communist activities and to turn over their associates. Not one, not two, but hundreds of pages were written with testimonies about appearances, meetings, conversations, sympathies for the partisan movement, everything that the defendants had thought and done as communists over the years. The police tried first of all to crush the morale of our comrades, to tear them away from the party and by blackmail to present them as people who had gone astray. But after familiarizing themselves with the materials collected on them by the police, they came to their senses and now ask the fascist court for forgiveness and mercy. Among the many defendants in those cold December days was our good guardian mother, Grandma Lena with her two sons, Lardo and Sando a 70-year-old woman who was charged as an accomplice of the partisans. Their presence in the hall greatly embarrassed the guardians of fascist power. The age of this woman spoke not only of the people's love for the partisans, it also spoke of the scale of the partisan movement. 44 defendants. That's 44 families. And how many more were affected by their relatives and friends who will hate the authorities? The fascists were afraid to even think about it. All these people would oppose the fascist authorities. The interrogation began. It was Lena's grandmother's turn. The old woman, starved in a fascist prison, looked proudly at the judges. Did you, old woman, think you could bring order to Bulgaria and overthrow the government? Was the chairman's first question. If, if you can't restore order, we'll have to restore it ourselves, replied Grandma Lena calmly. That's enough. Take her away, shouted the chairman. The guards grabbed the old woman and pushed her out into the corridor. Grandma Lena said only a few words, but here they were particularly powerful, and each was worth a year and a half in prison. The sentence did not break her. Crossing the threshold of Sophia Central, she said to the women who met her, If I had known that I would be tried in my old age, I would have left with Slavcho and Dencho. I would have done something useful. Grandma Lena's words reached us at once. They encouraged us even more. They were the words of a man beaten on the ground the words of a mother who had lost her freedom, but who had not lost her faith in a near victory. Twelve men out of forty-four defendants were sentenced to death. They were all partisans, Densho and I among them. This was the second death sentence passed on me by the fascists. In Sofia I immediately met with Zerdrodko Georgiev, the chief of staff of the zone, and gave him the message about the English mission. He, for his part, immediately notified the responsible comrades. It was decided that Vado Trichkov, commander of the Sofia Insurgent Operational Zone and representative of the Supreme Headquarters of the Bulgarian People's Liberation Army, would go to the train region to negotiate with the British? Delcho came to Sofia after me in connection with the same issue, and he was directly involved in its settlement. On December 25, he and Vlado Trichkov left for Trina Okoli. The new partisan TVL Fiefe Lishimov also left with them. I still had business in Sofia and had to stay behind. Delcho brought the joyful news that a whole company of soldiers, together with their commander Daiko Petrov, had defected to the partisans, and that eight soldiers from the garrison of Lebane in Yugoslavia had escaped and come to the detachment after long wandering. Among them were Boris Tashev from Sofia and Berov from the Kustendil region. In the Tsarist army, where the sons of workers and peasants served, there was complete discord. On the one hand, under the influence of the successes of the partisans, 
and on the other hand, under the influence of the party and the RMS, which markedly increased their work in the army. Many soldiers and officers who were not strangers to the suffering of the people sabotaged the orders of the command to persecute the partisans and their assistants both inside the country and in the occupied territory, left the fascist barracks and went to the partisans themselves. In those days, the hot topic of conversation was the highly patriotic feat of Lieutenant Petrov, who organized the defection of an entire military unit to the Macedonian partisans. He brought up on socialist ideas, having been for several years among the Rimsists and communists of his village, Daiko had a blood connection with our party. He could not calmly watch the Germans ruthlessly oppressing the Bulgarian people, could not reconcile himself to the fact that the Bulgarian fascists took away from the people and the few freedoms that the workers had won in their hard struggle. All this fueled the revolutionary fire in his soul. Having contacted Trifon Balkansky, a Bulgarian partisan in Macedonia, one December evening Daiko led all his border guerrillas to the partisans. Hearing about Daiko's exploit, the soldiers of the border guard post in the village of Kroševica, Serdulitsa district, Slavko Evdosiev, Stanko Borisov, Kairo Stoyanov, and Lubin Georgiev also left the post and went in search of our unit. Neither nights in bitter cold nor hardships could stop the young Remsists. They found the partisans and joined their ranks. Daiko's example was a battle cry that quickly spread throughout the platoons, companies, battalions and regiments of the Tsarist army. Dozens and hundreds of patriots responded to this cry. The strengthening of the ferment among the personnel of the Bulgarian army was greatly aided by the speech delivered in Moscow on November 6 in connection with the 26th anniversary of the Great October Socialist Revolution. The figures and facts given in the report of the Central Committee of the All-Union Communist Party was so convincing that no one could oppose them. It was an undeniable fact that the Nazi army had lost more than four million soldiers and officers, and that these losses put Germany before an inevitable catastrophe. It was also obvious that in a few months alone, under the onslaught of the Red Army, the Germans retreated westward by 500 to 1300 kilometers, resulting in the liberation of almost two-thirds of the temporarily occupied territory of the Soviet Union. From the line of Ordzanikidzis, Bielister, Taus Stalingrad, Voronezh, Vyazma, Razi, where the fascist troops were at the beginning of 1943, by the end of October of the same year they were pushed back to Kherson, Krivoy Rog, Kiev, Gomolyu, Orsha and Vitebsk. The liberation of Stalingrad, Rostov, Left Bank, Ukraine, Donbass, Taman, Oral, Smolensk and Kiev became known to the whole world, and the bridgeheads of the Soviet troops on the territory of Belarusia and Crimea created preconditions for new offensive operations. Italy fell away from the fascist coalition. This caused hesitation and other Hitler's satellites, who now thought only about how to avoid the impending disaster. Disillusionment with Hitler's new order was growing, and the prestige of plundering Germany was rapidly falling. During my stay in Sofia, I had the opportunity to meet with comrade Todor Zivkov for the second time. We talked with him about the work in the Trina, Breznik and Radomir districts, about the forthcoming actions of the party. At the beginning of the new year, it was planned to mobilize party and youth cadres, to activate the partisan movement and to replenish the units with new forces. In this regard, we expected a document of the Central Committee with specific instructions on the future activities of party and youth organizations and partisan detachments. During the meeting with Comrade Zivkov, the task of Kristen Kristinov was concretized. The latter was entrusted with party political and combat work in the Sofia village and Godechki Okolai, the area west of the Iskia Gorge. In this region, Kristen was to prepare the ground for the establishment in the near future of the shop partisan detachment, named so in honor of the shops. Bulgarians living around Sofia, who were to assist the detachment. On the orders of Comrade Zhikov, I, together with Kristen, went for a few days to Sofia Okolia to help him in the organizational work. We passed through the villages of Ilyansi, Vodiak, Bogyovsi, Petirsh, and Maslovo, met many people, held meetings, and intensified the work of a number of youth and party organizations. The situation in the Petet Party organization, which used to be one of the best, was alarming. Now it was stagnating. Comrades were distrustful of one another, but later everything improved, and the organization again became one of the first in the Okoliaps. It had grown to 20 men and had fielded a very active fighting group. 
A good impression was made by the Maslovsk and Bogiovsk party organizations. The communists of these organizations readily responded to the meeting appointed by us. The snowstorm did not prevent them from coming. They listened with great attention to the information on current events. It was evident that the work will go well here. The shops will not lag behind other districts. At the first meetings, we did not raise the question of going to an illegal position. First of all, we needed psychological preparation, conviction and righteousness of our cause, enthusiasm growing into militant passion. Everything had to develop consistently, and the necessary conditions were in place for this. People, time. I returned to Sofia on New Year's Eve. I went to the apartment of Stanka Jirova, the Remsist who in 1940 had been included in the leadership of the construction workers of the Tarn region. She was now connected with a number of tin workers, sheltered them and actively helped to bring comrades who were in an illegal situation and were being persecuted by the police to the detachment. That evening there was a wedding at her house. Her younger sister Lydia was marrying an engineer, Stefan Stoev, who also lived in the apartment and made false identity cards for the underground. Stefan's colleagues were present at the celebration, but I was a stranger to them. Lydia's friends were not at the wedding. Besides the sisters, there was their brother Victor, a soldier sent from the unit to study at a medical school, and the wife of their older brother Stoyan. Stoyan himself was not there. He had been mobilized and was serving in pirate. Though him we received from time to time ammunition, tarpaulins and other things. I didn't stay at the table. I went to another room and lay down to rest. I was introduced to the guests as a relative who had come from the village in connection with some trial that would be heard in a... I went to Stanka to have her put me in touch with Georgi Grigorov, who was to go with us under any circumstances. Stanka was engaged in directly sending new partisans to the detachment. Both before and now she stubbornly insisted that she too be sent to the detachment. She was ashamed to stay in Sofia at such a hot time. She thought that here she could be successfully replaced by her younger sisters Lydia and Venita. But Sofia was not safe at that time either. People lived in constant expectation of air raids and at any moment could be arrested along with those they were sheltering. I too had to be in the capital during the bombing. It was in the afternoon. I was alone in Stanka's apartment. Her sisters had gone to their mother in the village and Stanka had gone to the city on business. When the siren wailed, everyone rushed into the bomb shelters. I stood in front of the window, covered with black paper, and watched the flow of people. People pushed each other. You could hear the screams of women hurrying with their children to the bomb shelters. Everything reminded me of the sad picture of evacuation, when the enemy is in close proximity. I could not go down to the bomb shelter and stayed in the apartment on the second floor. There were gun salvos, then we heard the explosions of bombs. One bomb fell somewhere nearby and blew up some building, then shattered on the sidewalk. I thought, it was much better to be in the squad, to die in open combat with the enemy is preferable to dying from a bomb dropped on you when you are locked in a room. But even here, one had to live and fight. Stanker's apartment attracted the attention of the enemy. Delcho's brother Dimitar was a frequent visitor. The police noticed that he often came here, and the apartment was taken under close surveillance. On February day in 1944, as Dimitar was walking down the street, a dozen agents jumped on him, arrested him, mistaking him for Delcho, and immediately brought him to the police directorate. There was no limit to their joy. The chiefs were immediately informed by telephone of the success, and in response they were showered with praise and promises of awards. The immediate participants of the operation already saw themselves promoted. However, the police, having started the arrests, decided not to stop. They arrested Stanka, her brother Stojan, and his wife Totke. They were tortured for several months. Then they were brought before the fascist military court. Thus, with a death sentence, all four waited for freedom. Having arranged with Stanka to meet Georgie, I left their apartment and went to Krasnoselo to my old assistant Vasil Petrov. In those days he too was waiting every minute to be arrested, so he decided to arrange for me to stay with his tinsmith friend, whom everyone called Gosho Zestyanka. I found him at home. We had dinner together, and he decided to celebrate the new year in a tavern. His wife, knowing his habits, tried to stop him, explaining that it was awkward to leave a guest who was visiting them for the first time. I also tried to hold him back, but nobody could break Gosho's stubbornness. He got up and left. Midnight passed. There was no noise in the streets. The moon rolled across the clear dome of the sky. The stars grew paler. 
Gosho's wife leaned against the wide headboard of the wooden bed, weeping and saying to herself, Have I not earned a little respect? Why is he drawn to that damn tavern? Why did he run away from home? Now he sits there, drinks, comes back drunk, starts shouting, and wakes up the children and neighbours. I listened to the woman pouring out her sorrow and remembered my mother's life. My father had been like that, but now it was hard for me to take sides. I didn't know Gosho and his wife well. It was hard for me to judge their relationship, but one thing was clear to Mike should not have left home, since he had an underground member, and he turned out to be more than frivolous. For such an act he should receive the censure he deserved. It was beginning to dawn. The streets were coming alive. People, having celebrated the new year, were returning home. As always, the drunks were the last to return with songs and swearing. Now our anticipation had turned to anxiety, and we looked at the door hoping to see Gosho coming in. In vain. He was not in the street among the drunks, nor was he in the tavern. He had been arrested, and was now justifying himself to the police that it was not he but someone else who had been the cause of the tavern brawl. I did not wait for him. When I heard that he had been arrested, I left his house at once. Who knows what a drunken man might think of. For this episode, I managed to scold him only three months later. Gocho Gopin was from Trine, a lawyer by profession. He was very popular with the people of Trine, not only because he defended their interest in court, but also because he was one of the oldest and most active communists in Okoli. Many times the party nominated him for the People's Assembly. Many times the police expelled him. He worked not only in the Sofia Party organization. In 1940, Comrade Gopin was given the responsibility for work among the construction workers in Grase Okolia, and he often had to attend their illegal meetings. When he returned from the Nazi camp, he told me that he would certainly come to the unit, and we even agreed on the date when he should report to Trine. Everyone was expecting his arrival with great impatience. I also met Georgi Grigorov, the former secretary of the Okali Committee in Trine. We had not seen each other for the last few years, but he was the same Amati face with a slightly yellowish tint, his hair combed straight, the same sly or naive smile. We did not talk to him about the situation in Trianokoli and in the detachment. I thought it would be better for him to learn about everything on the spot in the detachment. He was the third man in the group that was to follow me on January 6. The place of meeting was the same place where before that I had appointed a meeting for Setsyei Todorova and Goraz Dimitrov, who had been handed over to me by Zidravko Georgiev. While Goraz, Liljana Dimitrov's brother, seemed very thin and tall in the darkness. The swarthy-faced Sets was quite small. From childhood, earning a piece of bread, she was exhausted by work. But the working environment and labour developed in her features of nobility and conscientiousness. While working at the factory, she simultaneously headed the sector of the MM's organisation of the Sugar for Sugar Factory Quarter, where the youth activist Strahil was well known. At first, she made a depressing impression on me. It seemed to me that she would collapse from fatigue already on the second kilometre of our journey. I had to help her suppress. Girl, we have a lot to walk. Every night, 20 to 30 kilometres. Think better if we didn't have to leave you somewhere. Don't look at me for being small. I'm tough. You'll see. I don't know how tough you are. That's why I'm telling you to think about it. No, be afraid, comrade. I will endure. I come from the village. She persuaded me, and if I die, it may be on my way to the detachment. She tried her best to show that she was ready for anything, and her eyes expressed anxiety. I looked at her and felt sorry for her. All right, on the sixth evening be ready. I will inform you additionally about the time. Hmm. And to finally dispel her doubts, I took an egg-shaped grenade out of my pocket and carefully, so as not to be noticed by any of the passers-by, put it in her hands. The girl glowed with happiness. Her gypsy eyes sparkled, and she ran merrily toward home. The grenade seemed to her a sure proof that she would definitely be in the unit. The last days of 1943 and the first days of the new year, 1944. When I was in Sofia, outwardly the city lived a normal life. Institutions and transportation were working. The streets were lively. Festively dressed people crowded in front of the cinemas to watch the latest German films. Frequent trips to Sofia took me away from my direct work in the squad. Therefore, I organised my work so that I could go to Sofia in exceptional cases, when the party and military leadership wanted to assign me personally some task. 
for all other matters special couriers were appointed who were to appear in Sophia only on certain days and at a certain place. However, because of the frequent bombings, which disrupted normal life, the couriers were in danger of getting hurt themselves or of not finding a contact. Therefore, in addition to couriers, legal comrades were involved in the work. For example, Ivanka Peshova and her brother Alexander from Ovchakupian were our Yataks, who carried out our errands with great precision and care. They supplied us with medicines, helped people to move to the detachment, ferried weapons and ammunition. Comrades Basil Petrov, Milan Tanezov, Harlembi Zakariev, Vasil Teodosiev and others also worked with unflagging energy. In the first days of the new year, deep snow fell. In some places it piled up knee-deep or even waist-deep. Great cold began. Blizzards were sweeping across the open field, covering wattles and bushes, ravines and deep ravines with loose snow. The January frost unceremoniously pinched, sneaking under the cloves. At six o'clock on the evening of January 6, in such bad weather, the tall, thin garazed and little tea setzer came to the appointed place, to the alley between the streetcar stops Baxton and Ovshikupil. Georgi Grigorov was not present. I considered it inexpedient to postpone our journey because of him. We left without him. The grandmother, Yarina, the mother of Ivanka and Alexander, gave us groceries for the road, and she spread her arms and held me on the threshold, not letting me go in such a snowstorm. Wait, where are you going in this weather? You'll get stuck somewhere. The wolves will eat you. Did you need it so badly? Grandma Yarina was worried as if I were her son. I can't not go, Granny Yarina. I have a job to do, and people too. I thank you for your motherly concerns, but... Goodbye. Grandmother Yurina lowered her hands and said something to Calistro and Alexander for not helping her to persuade me to wait out the blizzard. We set off briskly and in good spirits. Behind us was Sophia, where people were celebrating Christmas in those days. Gorazd and I paved the path. Weak Tizatsi followed our footsteps. We walked briskly up to Bankia, but when the steep ascent to the village of Klisura began, we began to get tired. Deep snowdrifts, icy snow and blizzard took away our last strength, and Raznik was still far away. At this pace we would not get there not only by morning, but also by the evening of the next day. We began to worry. Tired, frozen in the boundless snows, we could easily have fallen victim to the weather. It was possible to fight off the wolves. We were armed. Suddenly, as in a fairy tale, the roof of a house appeared ahead. It was covered by the branches of fruit trees, which bowed under the weight of icicles. We rejoiced. We glimmered hope. If we did not get a place to sleep, at least we would get warm. But the uncertainty of the people who inhabit this house made us think twice. This fabulous, promising peace, comfort and warmth of the house tempted us, calling us to cross its threshold. But what awaits us there? After all, anything can happen. Whatever happens, let's go in, I said to my comrades. If anything, we have weapons. The house was one-storied with a painted door and plat bands. From its appearance, one would have thought that a village teacher or a priest lived here. We knocked on the outer door. A man in his forties showed up. He received us kindly. We briefly explained to him that we were travellers. He did not show much curiosity, offered us a place on the floor and said good night. We slept together, and in the morning we began to talk. As much as the owner of the house was silent and reserved, his wife was curious and talkative. She inquired where we were from, who we were, why we were going at night, and where we were going. The courtesy with which we were received obliged us to satisfy the hostess's curiosity. We called ourselves teachers, and Sitsi was introduced as my wife. Gorast was her brother, and we made up that we were visiting acquaintances in Bankia, and that we were staying a while. All this was more or less true, but I had the impulse to say that we came from the village of Meshtitsa, and that we had been evacuated there. As luck would have it, the landlady was from Mestitsa. I almost got into trouble when she started asking about my family and parents. It was good that I knew a surname from that village and grasped at it, like a drowning man grasping at straws. Delcho had once told me that he had served with a certain Lipcho, of whom I had no idea. All I heard was that he was a progressive man. This helped me to get out of the situation, and when I was sure that my answers did not arouse the woman's suspicion, I hurried to ask her a series of questions, trying to steer the conversation to another topic. As I got out of the delicate situation, I mentally scolded myself. Why did I have to name the nearest village? There are not many villages far away. 
and in the same way we almost fell asleep in the monastery of St. Petka, when Delcho hastened to say that we were going to Raduja, which turned out to be the native village of the monastery servant. For lunch, the woman made mamalaga. She got butter, we got sugar and sausage, and everyone was satisfied with the lunch. We parted like old friends, thanked the hostess for her hospitality, and said, It's not worth it, it's not worth it, the landlady repeated as she walked us to the door. In such a cold dog and cat sleep together, not only people. Come in when you have a chance, the woman shouted, now we know each other. We thanked her sincerely for her kindness. We came to Rasnik in the evening. We had a little rest and went on to Bresnik. Little by little, unnoticed by anyone, we reached the house of Bai Lazo. In the afternoon we met with Aram Savov and Alexander Tinkov. In addition to instructions about the mass involvement of new forces in the partisan movement, I informed them of the decision of the detachment leadership that Comrade Todor Madanov had been appointed in charge of party work in the Bresniki district, with whom the entire district organization must keep in constant touch and to whom it must report its activities. This decision of ours was accepted positively by them. M. Madanov had the reputation of an honest and loyal young party member and was also a partisan. Almost the whole way Tetsae was interested in where we were going. Nerte, comrade, hmm, she addressed me. Hmm, tell me to which unit you are taking us. I would like to go to Trinsky. I answered the curious girl that unfortunately she could not go to the Trine detachment now, but if she wanted it so much, we would take her there at the first opportunity. Will it be soon? It may be soon, but we must get the consent of our squad commander. Will your commander allow it? Is he a good man? I see, a good man. Can a commander be bad? I don't know if he'll allow it or not. If only he would allow, if you knew how much I want to get into the Trinsky detachment. Dreamily said t -set. The girl's desire was understandable to me. Activity and successful operations have created a great fame for our squad. Legends were written about it. Some said that we had cavalry. Others, that we had over a thousand fighters. Others that we had a free territory with dozens of warehouses with weapons and food. The few horses we had in our detachment gave the police reason to say that we had cavalry, that we were numerous, that we were armed with automatic weapons, that the whole population was on our side. With this, the authorities justified their impotence and inability to cope with the detachment. But the common people considered all this to be true and for their part contributed to the spread of fantastic rumours outside our Ocoli. These rumours and legends later, when the party started mobilising its cadres, helped us a lot in our agitation. Your actions, said our leaders in Sofia, have a great political effect, and not only of local importance, we are using it in other places as well. You have helped us to activate the activities of other units as well. Your experience of involving the population in the work has been instructive for other districts as well. Thanks to the right methods of work, the population spoke of you as people brave and close to the people. This is the meaning of guerrilla warfare, to win the trust of the people. It was still a long way to Kalni, where we hoped to catch the detachment. We had to walk for another five or six nights, and even more in a blizzard. During the whole route we had to stop dozens of times to visit our tried and tested, well-secured yataks. Now, after the first failure, only the leaders of the detachment and couriers knew the places of our visits. Here we are in the Kashara of Bai Yako in Baba village. After the arrest of Bai Nadelko, we no longer visited his house. We moved to his neighbour Bai Yako. He was also an honest and devoted to our cause, and his Kosharas were very convenient. They were outside the village and there were no others nearby. In the barn we burrowed into the straw, but we could not sleep because of the cold. We pressed our backs against each other in vain. It was impossible to get warm. We moved to the fence, to the sheep. Here, too, there was no escape from the cold. We drove the sheep into the pen, built a fire, but it didn't help. There was no draught in the barn. The smoke filled the whole room. It was difficult to breathe. We put out the fire and decided to move to the cows. Together with the cows in the other half of the barn, the chickens were napping on a roost, and there were also a piglet and heifers. It was comparatively warmer here, and we settled down near the cows. The pig was the most noisy of all, he was grunting, puffing and chewing on the door. However, despite the noise, we slept well. Tiredness took its toll and we woke up only in the morning. 
when Radka, the wife of Bai Yako, came and began to curse loudly, surprised that the door was unlocked. Hey, a snake would have bitten the one who unlocked the koshara. Someone had done this to me on purpose. When she entered the barn, she stopped in amazement at the sight of us. How did you open it when it was locked? We have keys to all the locks and bolts, I joked. Radke went to make us breakfast. In her place came Bai Yako. All day long he stayed in the barn. In the evening I took the hidden rifle and we went to the village of Erul, hidden high up among the snowy mountain folds. It was January 10, midnight. At the moment when we were in the centre of the village, a glow appeared over Sophia. At first we were surprised to see this unprecedented phenomenon, but when the echo of explosions, the frantic firing of machine guns and anti-aircraft guns reached our ears, everything became clear the Americans were bombing the capital again. The hearts of the Aurelians clenched with pain. Each of them had relatives or friends in Sofia. Many of them had sent their breadwinners there to work, and now all their thoughts were turned to the absent ones. Both children and adults ran out onto the snow-covered street. From here it seemed that the whole city was on fire, and no one would get out of the ring of fire alive. There was an The women were shouting like at a wake, and the men sighed loudly and from time to time let loose a flowery profanity against the Germans, who were considered the main culprits of these brutal bombings. They cursed the Bulgarian government, which had declared a symbolic war on England and America, which were now sending whole squadrons of flying fortresses to Sofia, dropping not at all symbolic bombs. When the firing subsided and the sky began to clear, I gathered the peasants and briefly explained to them who was responsible for all these misfortunes, one after another falling on the head of the Bulgarian people. Those present severely stigmatized the perpetrators of the people's suffering and declared that they hated the fascist power and would fight for its overthrow. This short meeting further strengthened the bond between the partisans and the peasants. We realized how cordial the Erolchans were to us when two young men caught up with us to give us bread and lard. The young men apologized apologetically that they could not give us anything else. We went to buy Vasil's house. The door of his house was locked from inside, but he answered our knock at once. Nu, who knocks on my door in the middle of the night? I'm dying without you. Hearing the password, Bivasil opened the door and hugged me. Hey, Slavcho, I am dying without you, he repeated, calling me by my real name. Wow, what a conspiracy. TCT was happily surprised. So we're going where I dreamed we'd go? Well, now that I'm in Trine's troop, I'm not afraid to die? The mystery was over. There was no need for it any more. It was clear to the new partisans where we were going. Now they were looking forward to meeting with the detachment, the composition of which they did not know, but assumed that there were many partisans in the detachment. The first fighters we met were Dencho, Nedialko, Zlatan and Raicho. They were waiting for us in the Mahala of Varina Padina, where we had previously agreed to meet. Here we found Slavcho, who had come from Radomir district, with a new partisan, Nikola Lazov. The whole group gathered at Auntie Stainer's house, our Yatachar was always happy to see many partisans, and if there was not enough bread in the house, she resorted to the help of neighbours, but she did not leave us hungry. She tried not only to feed us, but also to put something in our bags for the road. The comrades from the detachment felt great joy when new partisans came to us and immediately began to train them. In Verena Padina, I met with the comrades who had come for instructions, Bai Nako from Goroshetitsivi and Georgi Vasilev from Dokyovsi. Here I had a serious talk with Georgi Vasilev and recalled an incident when he had forced me to leave his house in the middle of the night under the influence of his relatives, or simply chickened out and led me into such thickets and gullies that I barely got out of there. And Baini Nako. He was changing by the hour, not by the day. A man who had recently been afraid of everything, he became unrecognizable, determined, devoted to our movement. The Nako of today was not like the Nako I had known before, the one I had met in October. Now Nako was ready to die for the party, for our cause. Just the kind of people the liberation movement... When do you think you will be with us? He asked, and I caught in his gaze a genuine enthusiasm and devotion. I'd like you to come very much. Okay, by Nako, we will. You pull up the organization. People need to be on hand and willing to sacrifice like you. I am doing my best but you know there's one lousy sheep in a flock of one hundred. If there was only one, it would be nothing. There would be no more. That's what they say, said Bainako. We will try not to fail. 
After I had informed the comrades from the detachment and from the villages about the issues to which Comrade Zivkov had drawn attention, namely about the forthcoming mobilization of party and youth cadres, about the urgency of deploying the detachments as soon as possible, we left for Palilula. These questions were to shake everyone up. We were happy that more people would join the squads, that where agitation had not helped, party discipline would help. We knew that those who did not want to part with their families would try to hide or pretend to be sick. It was necessary to take timely action against this. Now this was one of the main tasks of our political officer. Palilula is a small mahala of the village of Upper Melna. There were only five houses. In one house lived by Georgie, in another his brother Nenko, in the third. Alexei, the fourth house, was occupied by Ignat, the fifth mile. The first two owners were tailors, and good tailors at that. Alexei was a farmer, Ignat was a former policeman, and Mile was a locksmith. Ignat by Georgie and his brother Nenko had once belonged to the Democrat Party, and by old habit still considered themselves adherents of it. Mile and his brother Alexius were members of our party. Ignat supported the fascist power. The oldest person in Palilula was by Georgie Mustakela. He was about 60. The youngest was Mile, he was about 35 years old. Almost all the men had moustaches, but by Georgie had a much longer one than the others with Podusniki. That's why we nicknamed him Mustakela. This, by the way, was good for conspiracy. By Georgie's tall, waspish figure was very imposing. He was tactful and attentive, calm and balanced. His figure harmonized well with the mountain landscape. As a boy, when I traveled with my father through Palilula to Lower Melna for the fair, I saw Bai Gore at work. He was already a tailor. He didn't expect anything from anyone. He joined the Democrat Party simply because the Democrats enjoyed good fame, and Bai Georgie valued good fame as much as he valued good people. Then the Democrats were completely disgraced, and Bai Georgie gave up on them. It is better to be a nobody than a scoundrel Democrat. Barnenko was also attracted by the Democrats, promising him service, and even what kind of service. In the police. However, after carrying a gun for some time, he realized that this job was not for him, threw the gun and refused. So the piece of bread that his tailor's trade brought him was much sweeter. He earned it by the labor of his own hands, not by sneaky denunciations which were expected of him by the police. Bynenko was as tall as by Georgie, but a little thinner, wore his moustache trimmed, and was by nature an intelligent man. Mile and Alexis had long been communists. They were accustomed to labor and, most importantly, saw beyond their fellow villages, especially Ignat, who until recently had served as a policeman. In spite of the fact that Ignat's and Alexis's houses clung to each other and the neighbors helped each other in everything, Alexei observed the necessary conspiracy and never once spoke out. All five houses of the Mahala were scattered. By George and Miel lived by the road leading from Upper to Lower Melna. The houses of the others were in the valley, about 200 meters from them. Except Mile, who, having missed the time of his youthful impulses, was now afraid to marry and lived as an old bachelor. All of them were married and had two or three children each, and by George, I remember, had five or six, most of them having already left their parents' nest. Slavka, 20 years old, and Borislav, the youngest son, a student of the last class of the Tryon Gymnasium, stayed with him. An unmarried daughter and son lived with Beninko. Stanka was 19 or 20 years old. Milan, the same age as Borislav, was also a student of the last class of the gymnasium. Ignat had two children living in his share. Zlatko, a gymnasium student of the last class, and Vasil, if I am not mistaken, a gymnasium student of the fifth class, and Vaska, Milko and Roska were growing up in the house of Bay Alexei. Vasco was the eldest and had only elementary education. Milko studied in Trina together with Vasil Ignatov, and ten-year-old Roska went to the second or third grade of elementary school. Slavka and Snanka were already pregnant. All these young people of Palilula, organized and unorganized, were modest, conscious, and very good. And we hoped that in the course of the struggle they would become even better, even more conscious. In general, the people in the Mahal, both old and young, even though some of the older ones belonged to other parties and had different professions, were good and honest. And the fact that there were party and RMC members, among them made our job of bringing the others into the organization easier. That's the kind of person Palilula was. I had to pass through Palilula several times when I was not yet in the underground. 
and I came here illegally for the first time in the fall of 1942, when the secretary of the party organization in the village was Stoyan, Mistakler's eldest son. Then I spent the whole day in their barn, trying not to show my face to my elders. In the fall of 1943, we spent one day in the church forest near Palilula, where we took the partisan oath. At that time, we learned from the local Remsists that there were two pistols in Palilula. They described their shape to us. From the description, we guessed that we were talking about a Nagan and a Parabellum. Such a weapon was worth raising even the elderly by Georgie in the middle of the night, though we had great respect for his age. The need for weapons was too great. Of course, neither by Nenko nor by Georgie did not try to hide the weapons from us. We immediately received them, but the way they met us, the way they gave us the weapons, we realized that in front of us were people sympathetic to our struggle, ready to act and support us. From that moment, we became close friends. We were now at the house of Bai George for the fourth or fifth time. Despising fatigue, we hurried to Bukova. Movement, endless marches, offensive activity were the pledge of our success and elusiveness. In Bokov, we called a large village-wide meeting. Here I unexpectedly met Vasil Teodosiev, my Sofia Yatak. He had come with his wife, Reina. They had left Sofia after the bombardment of January 10. Now Aunt Mara and by Nikifor Vasil remained in the capital, and here he could be useful to us. No one suspected of his connection with the partisans, especially in the presence of people I did not have to emphasize our closeness. If it was necessary to entrust him with something, I had to do it through other JTEX. After the meeting in Bokov, we went to the village of Sleshopsi. We had just entered the village when we were informed that there was a policeman on leave. Does he have a gun? One of us immediately asked him. He has a brand new one. He bragged to the guys yesterday. Will he shoot at us? Yoto asked. It depends on what position you put him in. We surrounded the house and after a few minutes the gun was handed over. On Zlatan's right side was a new Sektor's Brojovka. It took us three days to reach the village of Dobro Polje in the Yugoslav territory, where the detachment and Vlado Trikov were waiting for us. The way was very hard. The mountains were covered with snow, a blizzard was raging, and only by superhuman efforts our comrades overcame these obstacles. Tetsa deserved admiration. The girl did not tremble neither before the deep snowdrifts nor before the storm. She kept up with the old partisans and perfectly withstood the difficult test. At last we reached Dobropol. It lay on the other side of the Vysinska River, which having absorbed the waters from the slopes of the Viratop and Kemenik, waded among the huge boulders scattered haphazardly along its course, and between the rocks that had once formed a single massif, and reeking out into the open Vlasitinska plain, flowed into the famous Moravar. Dobro Polje spread out on the slopes of Mount Jastribid, approximately 50 square kilometers in area. This made it difficult for the partisans to organize, but at the same time prevented the police from pursuing them. If the enemy appeared at one end of the village, couriers would immediately bring alarming news. And look, at the other end is already taking action and the guerrillas avoided danger. This was difficult to do only when the police or troops came at the guerrillas in a broad front from the forest. But this did not happen often, only when the enemy pulled forces from many areas. Probably for this reason the Yugoslav comrades chose this very place, the village of Dobro Polje, as the base for the British mission. Here, in addition to Vlado Trichkov and the detachment, we found the English mission consisting of four officers and the Yugoslav representative Vladimir Vujovic. The mission was headed by a short, important, rosy-cheeked major who introduced himself to us under the name of Davies. The mission consisted of three other British officers, two of whom were radio operators. The mission had its own radio, over which cipher transmissions were made. The radio operators were more in a separate room, and we only saw them at lunch and dinner in the common room. Everyone was impressed by the enviable appetite of the British. They chugged the hot soup so noisily and quickly that drops of sweat fell from their heated faces into the plates. The guerrillas could hardly restrain themselves from laughing at the sight of them and quietly exchanged remarks about them. They still did not understand anything. It was evident that the mission was in radio contact with its military base in Egypt. Among those gathered, the broad-shouldered, massive Vlado Tritkov stood out prominently. His high forehead was furrowed with wrinkles, the stamp of long years of hard life of a revolutionary. 
Lado Trichkov grew up and matured in the ranks of our heroic Blagovsko Dimitrovskaya party. He was in exile in the Soviet Union, fought in Spain, then held responsible party positions in Bulgaria, and had a rich organizational and political experience. As soon as we arrived, he immediately informed us of the results of negotiations with British mission. Davies endeavored to present the purpose of his mission as exceptionally noble, expressing the extraordinary concern of his government for the Bulgarian partisans, to whom it wished to render assistance in arms and clothing. We had no reason to refuse aid, considering that it was offered to us gratuitously as an army fighting in the United Front of the United Nations. Where the Soviet Union is, there we are, said Vlado Trikskov. If they came with good intentions, we should express our trust in them and bring the negotiations to a successful conclusion. And we did. Now we had to get weapons and ammunition. But from the first day, Major Davies began to come up with all sorts of tricks and excuses. The chief of the mission excused himself with bad weather or lack of communication or lack of weapons at the base. Day after day passed in this way, and still there were no weapons. Let's wait some more, said the patient Vlado Trichkov. Let's see how long they'll drag on. While we waited for the British planes, the mission wasted no time. It collected information about the number of detachments, about the number of detachments throughout the country, about how many partisans there were, how many communist partisans, how many belonged to other parties, what the mood of the people was, and many other things that were not at all the responsibility of a mission of a friendly country. Evidently, this data was needed by the English government for some special purpose. In the meantime, Vlado Trichkov was busy helping us in every possible way, both in combat and in political training. He told our comrades about the battles of the Spanish Civil War, showed us how to train new fighters, gave a number of talks on a short course of the history of the All-Union Communist Party, and got better acquainted with the party remnant organizations. And here the experienced party and military leader was able to help us in many ways. In his presence, we held a party meeting. Before the members of the organization, he spoke about the role of communists in the guerrilla movement, about the high demands that are made of them. At this meeting, we accepted several new members into the party, and in place of the dead Strahil, we elected a new party secretary, and at the same time, deputy commissar of the detachment, Comrade Boris Tashif. After the election, Vlado Trikkov sigh. The secretary is a person who mobilizes the communists to carry out the commander's orders. He must be able to arouse the enthusiasm of the fighters, to inspire them, to penetrate into the heart of each of them. These words of Vlado Trichkov made us think about many things. With the arrival of comrade Vlado Trichkov and the English mission, the detachment moved to them and took over their security duties. From the available partisans in early December, we formed a battalion of two Chetniks, nominated Dimitar Takov as commander of the battalion and Getso Nedjechev as commissar. The battalion was named after Basil Levski, the brightest and most humble person in the history of the revolutionary movement in Bulgaria. Until the end of February, the leadership of the unit remained in the same composition. More than 20 days had passed while waiting for the promised weapons. The detachment would have suffocated from inactivity if they had not used this time for combat and political training, if it had not been for the excellent talks of Vlado Trichkov on the history of the party and on other, most diverse issues. On January 21, the anniversary of Lenin's death was celebrated. A report on the life and work of the founder of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union and the Soviet state was read by Vlado Trichkov. He especially emphasized that all the life and activities of Lenin, the leader of the revolution, have always been inseparable from the irreconcilable struggle for the unity and purity of the party, against all sorts of left and right elements, against leftist and rightist bias, and linked the need for unity and purity in the ranks of the party with unity and discipline in the unit as the basis of its combat effectiveness. Days went by, no weapons arrived. The peasants burned a lot of wood and straw every night, laying out signal fires. In addition, the frequent appearance of individual British planes had harmful consequences. These planes marked the area where we were and where we had to drop weapons, and this made it easier for the Nazis' orientation and concentration of fascist forces in the area. As a result, a little later we had to fight fierce battles with Bulgarian troops and police for some transports and pay dearly for English weapons. The victim of this game with the fate of our guerrilla movement later became the chief of mission himself, Major Day.
the non-seriousness of the reasons given by the mission for the delay in the delivery of arms could not fail to exasperate you. In the end, having made sure that they had no intention at all to deliver weapons to us, and the fascists were intensively preparing to encircle us, Vlado Tritkov, Vuya and I called Major Davies and gave him an ultima. Either the weapons would be delivered immediately, or they would find death here among the deep snows in these mountains. This measure proved quite effective. Early the next day, early in the morning, Davies personally contacted his superiors and probably relayed our warning to him. After the conversation, he reported that we could surely expect guns the following night. Sevrish preparations began. We mobilized a dozen sledges to bring firewood and straw to a large clearing covered with snow, where we expected the boxes of weapons to be lowered. At twenty places, in a U-shaped piles of wood were placed for fires, which were to be lighted at a certain time. By nine o'clock in the evening the whole troop and many of the peasants were gathered in the clearing. Both Davies and Vlado Trichkov were here. The transport was to arrive at ten o'clock, so it would be possible to get through the morning without leaving any traces. The fires flared up. The darkness split and retreated. Partisans and peasants broke into groups and commented softly on the upcoming event. Would the English fail this time too? They have already cheated us more than once. By Zacharias was worried. This time they will not deceive us, he assured him Dencho, who knew about our conversation with David. Near and far guards, near and far reconnaissance were organized around the clearing. We knew that loads do not fall exactly at the designated spot. Some are carried far away, and it takes a long time to find them, unpack and carry them. The minutes passed slowly. It seemed as if the hands of the clock, caught on something, had stopped. No, the clock was running. In the silence of the night we could hear it tirelessly ticking away the time. We picked up the slightest noise. But why couldn't we hear the airplanes? Had they left at all? And if so, where were they now? Over the Mediterranean, over Italy, over Greece, over Yugoslavia. Indeed the journey has been long and the cargo must be considerable. Still, it was time for me to arrive, if they had flown out. Doubt again took possession of the men who, without looking away, gazed into the dark sky. Hmm, hush, commanded Vado Trichkov, listening. They are coming, he added confidently. Everyone fell silent, staring upward, in the direction from which they were expecting the planes. The roar of the engines was getting closer. Here it was already heard very close, but the planes were not yet visible. They were fighters, flying ahead of the transport and guarding it from a great height. We could not see them, but we felt that they were circling above us, waiting for the transport planes. The rumbling grows. More planes appear and start circling. The transport planes descend low, they are already visible. Under the starry sky a parachute opens. The second, the third, the fifth dozens of huge silver mushrooms appear above the clearing. We already distinguish the boxes, some long, others shorter. The hard work began. Who collected the boxes, who loaded them, who covered the tracks? The loaded sleds were quickly driven to the Mahala, where the squad was located and where they had to unpack the crates, wipe off the grease from the weapons, sort and distribute them. Every fighter was now expecting something new, a rifle, an automatic or a machine gun. But very soon disappointment set in. If the clothing was well stocked, the weapons were in disarray. Either there was no ammunition for the rifles or there was no clip for the machine guns or the grenades were missing caps and fuses. For this reason, we could only use a small portion of the weapons. Everything else was mothballed until a new shipment arrived. We had to take the weapons away from Dobropol immediately, because the next day we were going to have a serious fight with the enemy. The January bombing of the capital created a lot of trouble for the citizens of Sofia. Fearing that American bombers would reappear over the city, the population of Sofia began to evacuate en masse in disorder. While the wealthy hired entire wagons and trucks to carry their luggage, the poor carried their belongings by the hump in baby carriages or simply loaded their belongings onto bed nets and pulled them like sleds. Men, women and children stretched from the city to the nearby villages seeking shelter. But no one could guarantee that the bombs would not find them there too. Considering the plight of the Sofia workers, the district committee of the BKP issued a proclamation which revealed the reasons for this situation and pointed out a way out of it. The only salvation, said the proclamation, is in the courageous struggle to expel the Germans and their agents from our country and in the establishment of a fatherland front government. 
arm yourselves and act. Provide all possible assistance to the partisans and come over to their side. Further, the district committee specifically addressed the officers and soldiers of the Tsarist army. Officers and soldiers. In these critical days, help your people rise up with arms in your hands and join the struggle of the people. Act independently against the Germans and the pro-German government. Help the partisans come to their side. They are the true fighters for our freedom and national independence. Only immediate action by the army. The people and the partisans will save the country from ruin. The main attention of the party in this period was directed at the army, the main support of the anti-people government and the fascist state. The Tsar and his henchmen tried to involve the entire officer corps in the bloody robbery, so they sent troops to pursue the partisans, burn their houses. To this end, from the beginning of 1944, the fight against the partisan movement was entirely entrusted to the army. In January, the party issued a historic circular number two. In it, the Central Committee summarized the results of the past period and set specific tasks for the future. The war entered its last and decisive phase. The Allies were concentrating the main reserves for the final decisive blow. The plans for this strike were agreed. They were to bring to the complete destruction of Hitler's Germany and its satellites. The Red Army continued its victorious advance westward. Anglo-American troops were preparing for the invasion of Europe from the south and from the west. The liberation movement in the countries enslaved by Germany was growing, covering new territories and dealing heavy blows to Hitler's war machine. The belief in German invincibility was finally shaken. The defeat of Nazi Germany was already obvious to a blind man. After the aerial bombardment of Sofia and other cities of the country, our people got a real idea of the horrors and devastation that would follow if Bulgaria entered the war. And at this very moment, the ruling fascist clique was preparing to plunge the country into the flames of war. What would happen if the party, the forces of the Fatherland Front, and the people did not stand against this decision? Now the question was being decided in whose hands Bulgaria would be. In the hands of the dishonorable Tsar mercenaries, who were the tools of fascist Germany, or in the hands of the Fatherland Front, which represented the progressive forces. The Communist Party sounded the alarm. It raised to its feet all its members and associates, all the adherents of the Fatherland Front, all the people, calling for a bold and ruthless struggle against fascism for its final defeat. Now, precisely now, at this very moment, it was necessary to save Bulgaria. To carry out this task, the party gave specific instructions to the party and Remsis organizations, to their leaders, to the partisan units, to their leadership, to every member of the party. In connection with the party directives on the deployment of the partisan movement in early February, the party political apparatus of the detachment undertook extensive explanatory work to recruit new partisans. To fulfill this responsible task, the detachment under the leadership of Dencho Hayden was sent to Christ, while I and Raiko Tukov went to Znipol. At the same time, Tudor Madanov, Svilin Veselinov, and Stavcho Radomirsky went to their monas and comrades. Violeta Jakova went to work with Slavcho as a youth assistant, because Rilka Borisova was punished and suspended from leadership work. None of us really imagined how difficult it would be to get the party and Remsist organizations, not to mention the non-party masses, to fight. Sat seemed to think that at this stage of the struggle, mobilization would be easy. We counted very much on the evacuated Sophia residents, who were now living with relatives and acquaintances. With this conviction we went to the villages. However, on the first day we encountered unexpected difficulties. In February everything was covered in ice. Mountains, fields, rivers, houses, and trees slept under a thick cover of snow. The temperature reached 30 degrees below zero. People were afraid to show their faces outside, much less sleep in the open air. In addition, the police brutally persecuted the families of the partisans, expelling them and burning their homes and everything they owned. Some were deterred by this, others hesitated, and still others developed their own protective philosophy, and nothing could convince these people of the wrongness of their positions. First of all, we encountered difficulties in the Kirchin Mahal of the village of Sishopsi, where the excellent Vash Yatoks lived. Milor Iosifov, a party member, and Irina Mikhailovna and Gana Todorova remsists. Gana had an older brother, Alexander. He wrote poetry under the pseudonym Yelin. He was once a kind and modest guy, and so when I learned that he had come to my parents' house, I rejoiced. 
as I expected him to be the first to stand up under the banner of the struggle. We found him in the house of their neighbor Irina. Here, in front of a group of our fighters, he enthusiastically recited his poems and, reveling in their music, now and then squinted his slightly bulging eyes. We had not seen each other for a long time. He was now married and seemed to me to have aged prematurely. His cheekbone face and thick black mustache made him look strikingly like Gorky. His long hair, falling down over the collar of his coat, resembled the hairstyle of some famous painter or sculptor. By the way, Blin's poetic soul gravitated to sculpture. He created artistically executed fireplaces made of artificial marble, various figures, columns, and so on. In short, Yellin had golden hands, they gave him a good income. In general, he was an original and spent much of his time on originality. When I entered the house, he was reciting. I wanted to embrace him, but was sorry to interfere with the poet's fervor. When he finished the last stanza, I approached him and shook his hand. Sasho, you and I are old comrades. Listening to your poems, I realized that you have not changed your views and decided to become a partisan. Join us today. You will inspire us with your beautiful poems and your poetry will become even more true and exciting. No, I have nothing against it, brother. Yelin answered me. But now I am here as a guest. I am not ready to go to the detachment. I have a lot of things in Sofia and I need to clean them up. Otherwise, the American bombs will blow everything up. As soon as I'm done, I'll come, I'll come solemnly. Together with my wife? Sweat beaded on Yellen's face. Leave the solemnity, let's just go now, and buy things when we defeat fascism. No, no. Slavo, a man should come to you in a good mood, with a desire. I'm not ready now. I'll come a little later. When is later, Sasha? Name the day, the date we'll come for you. Sasha was embarrassed. He felt that a communist must not lie, must be sincere before the party. It was hard for him to tell us to leave him alone, but he didn't want to go to the partisans. Of course, in the Cherry I do near Sofia, where he lived tender poetic editions and their real embodiment, much more pleasant, quieter, and most importantly, safer. Yelin did not tell us this, withheld his thoughts. He made a promise, and our couriers came several times to the Kirchin Mahala to fetch him and each time, returning, indignantly said, Yelin has fooled us again. The Slesov Party organization was one of the largest in the Okolia, and given the established traditions, the Slesov communists should have set an example to other organizations. Unfortunately, at that time, no one expressed a desire to join the partisans. Only the Remzist Hana wanted to join, but she was influenced by her brother and hesitated. In Glagovovica, Grandfather Milan, Father Stojan and Sadzdo, who were now in prison, Raiko Tarkov, and I caught sight of two young men we did not know. They were sitting side by side, at a large table, extended to the middle of the room opposite them sat Grandfather Milan, his wife and daughter Natka, the bride, in an unnaturally good mood. The table was covered with a large white linen tablecloth in yellow patterns that looked like bells. On one edge of the table for the solemn occasion, there was a small bottle filled with rakija. The smell of rakija spread throughout the room. It was easy to tell from the look of this tankard that it had witnessed more than one wedding, more than one celebration. It reminded Grandfather Milan and his wedding, reminded him of the kuma who had brought it as a wedding present. Natke was wearing a new dress with a small neckline, black chevrolet shoes. In the faint light of the lamp a thin layer of powder was barely visible on her pink face. The young people turned out to be from the neighbouring village of Byzantsi. We had no ties with this village. We didn't even know if there was an organization there. One of them, Nadka's fiancé, was skinnier and more talkative. The other was formal with his hosts and only dropped a word now and then. The talkative guy sat across from me. His name was Timcho. Realizing that we were partisans, he took out a notebook and a pencil from his pocket and hastily scribbled a few words. Folding it fourfold, he enclosed a small photograph and handed it to me with a request that I read it now. The note contained the following. I, a classmate of Comrade Dencho, fully share your views. Our house is the first on the left on the road from Wukan village. Our whole family loves the partisans and is looking forward to them. We are ready to help you in any way we can. Ask for Tihomir Nikolov. I'm waiting for you. Leaving the house of Grandfather Milan, we pondered for a long time over the content of the note. Whether it is not a trap, or indeed there are people who are eager to participate in the struggle, but have no way to contact the partisans. And if this is an honest man, we thought, 
then what a shame to such communists as the poet Yellin, to those fourteen party members from the village of Slyshopsy, to the cadet Raisho Nikolov, Liko Dimitar Toshev, who, no matter how much we begged, refused to go to the partisans? This note puzzled us. The first thing we had to do was to find out who Tikhomir was, and then to find out what his family was like. Inquiries could be made in Radovo, the nearest village to Byzantsi. In Radovo, after the arrest of the Nikolov brothers and other members of the party and youth organizations, there were mostly very young people and very few of those who were older. To the older comrades belonged Georgi Babin Rusin and Georgi Ilyev Mititi, a builder who I knew as a member of the Radovo party organization. It was unclear to me how he had managed to avoid prison, but nevertheless I decided to find him. Not knowing exactly where he lived, I knocked on one of the doors, which had no porch or fence in front of it. A woman's voice answered, No, who are you looking for? Oh, open up and I'll tell you who we're looking for, Raturika replied. The woman pulled back the edge of the curtain on the darkened window, and at the sight of us thundered through the window. Window, and at the sight of us she shouted loudly. What is this? Raiko asked himself. That's what it is. She was frightened herself and decided to frighten us. I moved closer to the window, trying to calm her down. As soon as she realized that we were not looking for evacuees, but for her neighbor, she calmed down. This was the usual attitude of people who did not know the goals of the struggle and were influenced by the slanderous fabrications of the police at our address, who presented us to the people as more frightening than a devil. From Georgi Ilyev we needed to know, first, what Tikomir Nikolov was, second, where the house of Georgi Babin Rusin and the road to the village of Izvor was, and third, how in that village it was easier to find the house of Joseph Marianov, my fellow soldier. Georgi Ilyev knew a little about the people and helped us. The information about Timcho was good, and about his father Nikola Nikolchev, even better. The first thing we did was to visit Georgi Babin Rusin. What? Hmm, he asked. Mm, do we need partisans? Youth in the partisan detachment, we specified. It will be done, brothers. Come back in a few days, my guys will be ready. Will you keep your promise? Of course, without hesitation, he confirmed. I answer with my head. We believed his words and went to the village of Izvor. Izvor was 500 meters away from Radovo. Raicho and I had never been here before. We knew that it would be difficult to find a house according to the description but there was no other way out. Illuminated by the moon, many houses resembled one another. Finally, we stopped in front of a house that, according to the description, was similar to the house of Comrade Marianov. We opened the gate and entered the yard. The dog did not greet us with a bark. He was sound asleep, warm on the straw. We approached the front door. We noticed a small window on the right. We knocked. No one answered. Knock again. Moo. Oh. Oh, oh came a squeaky female voice. No. Travellers, open up for us. What travellers at this hour? asked the same voice. Ertinary ones, open up and you'll see. I can't open, said the woman. Who knows what kind of people you are? The conversation was fruitless, but we persisted. Open up, shouted Raiko. We're cold, we want to get warm. We felt that we were in the wrong house, but it was uncomfortable to ask about Joseph Marianov. No, who are you to wake us up in the middle of the night? A male baritone was heard. Open up and you'll see. Leave me alone, you're still on my head. I won't. Listen, man, you'll open like a sweetheart. Don't make us break the door. We are partisans. You should have said so, said the man. I'll open the door. They prepared their pistols and took up a suitable position at the door, just in case. The bed creaked, the inner door opened and footsteps approached the entrance. The key was turned, the lock clicked and the door opened. A tall man with a carefully styled beard and long hair stood before us. Are you not the teacher? I asked this deliberately. There was no doubt that the man before us was a priest. No, I'm a priest. I apologize that we were so rude to a servant of God, but you also contributed a little. The priest apologized for not immediately guessing who we were, but kindly invited us to sit down. When we left his house, Raiko and I went to the headman's house to hand him our resignation. He turned green when he saw us, but there was no other choice. We had to choose either to serve the fascists and fear for our own skin, or to give up the service. 
There's no need to cry, Raiko told him. What you make your bed, you can lie on it. Do they ask me whether I want to or not, muttered the headman. Everybody gives orders, and I don't know who to listen to now, you or them. Listen to us. We told him firmly and imperiously. If you like your life, give up your service tomorrow. If not, tell us now, so that we may not come to you a second time. Raiko took a piece of paper out of his pocket and handed it to the headman. This was our order number 13. It read, Within ten days from the date of this order, all the above-mentioned administrative officers shall resign or contribute henceforth to the People's Liberation Movement. At the end, the detachment headquarters warned that anyone who did not wish to comply with the order would be severely punished. This order was deliberately issued under the number 13. Knowing the psychology of the majority of people to whom it was addressed, we were sure that the number 13 itself would make many people think, and they would certainly hurry to fulfill the order. The significance of this order was enormous. It struck fear into the fascists and played a great role in disorganizing the police administrative apparatus. After crossing the Vukanschtitsa River, we took a country road to Byzantsi. Although the information about Tim Show and his father was favorable, we decided to exercise the utmost caution. Their house was fenced on all sides and could be approached through two gates, one leading to the stable and the other to the wicket of the courtyard in front of the house. We went through the courtyard to the west-facing window, where we could see a metal grill from a distance. When we knocked a huge white dog, the guardian of the house snapped at us from under the shed overhang. However, running up to us, he grabbed a piece of bread and did not bark any more. By the way, we had some poison for angry dogs. An elderly man appeared in the window, Tahomir's father. Uncle Kolo was about fifty years old, with a few deep wrinkles on his ruddy, swarthy face and a small trimmed moustache. The house had two rooms and an annex with a hearth for baking bread. One of the rooms was large, the other was small, intended for newly weeds. In front of the house was a small veranda. In one corner of it the dog usually lay, the other was cluttered with household stuff. In the big room where the whole family of Uncle Kolo slept, I saw Nodka, a girl from the village of Hlohovica. Since the wedding had not yet taken place, Tim Show's parents, according to the old custom, did not allow the young people to sleep together. So Tihomir and his brother slept in a small room, while the bride slept in the old people's room. In addition to two wooden beds, on which thick planks lay instead of springs, in the middle of the room rested a large potter's wheel, on which Uncle Kolo's family earned their living. Not far from the wheel, a small radio set stood on a wooden bench covered with a white embroidered cloth. We arrived late and woke up all of Uncle Kolo's household, Nadka Maga Rayaya. Vitka got up and dressed quickly. Tahomir and Duncho came out of the next room, and Auntie Stoyanka immediately heated the stove. The dry wood hummed in the stove. The conversation went on long, no one fell asleep until morning. Vitka and Reina told legend after legend about the partisans, and Aunt Stoyana was eager to tell what she had heard about the priest of Lesnikov and the Okali governor Dragulov. Is it true? she asked that the priest of Lesniki is a communist and that you drive Dragolov like a goat through the villages? Uncle Kolo probably felt embarrassed at his wife's questions and intervened in the conversation. Leave it, Stoyanka, don't ask about nonsense. Partisans only have the job of driving Dragulov around the villages. A man like him and his kind should not have a bell around his neck, but a bullet in his forehead. And the priest, smiled Uncle Kolo, is not a communist at all. He just sympathizes with the partisans. Auntie, said Reina, who had studied in the city, is it true that the commander of a partisan unit disguises himself in women's clothes, comes to the fascists and, having disarmed them, leaves a note in which he tells them who he is? Maybe it's true. Uncle Kolo replied and smiled, turning to us. Partisans are elusive, brave. That's why the fascists are afraid of them. Maybe it's true, repeated the words of the master Raiko. We do not know everything that the commander does. When the people support the struggle, mm, Uncle Kolo spoke with heat. Mm, they do not think of anything in favor of the fighters. He wants the partisans to be farther, bolder, and always more resourceful than the enemy, with whom they fight not for life, but for Do we not see and feel for ourselves how the partisans defend our interests? Uncle Kolo lived the struggle of the party and correctly understood the situation. From my conversation with him, I realized that he was not in words, but in deeds ready to help our struggle. Uncle Cullo was not a coward. 
Without any reservations, he called the old communists Georgi Karakashev and Stoyan Ilyev to his house, and on the same day we organized a party group. We also gave Timko the task to create a Remsist organization in the village, on which we could later rally. It was a short distance to the village of Yarlopsi, but Raiko never complained of fatigue. I was struck by his vigor and endurance. He had some special nervous system that kept him in constant tension, as much as Dencho was an expert at sleeping and managed to fall asleep even on his feet. Raiko was tireless. He seemed to have the secret of vigor. He didn't like to talk about his family. Maybe he was afraid of giving in to the feeling of longing that lurked in his hot, responsive heart. This time Raiko was in a good mood and talked. This mood was given to him by the news from his garricks, as he called them. They wrote that the hogs were alive and well, and asked him to give their good wishes to everyone. Grandpa Taco really wanted us to overthrow fascism sooner and replace fascist power with people's power. Our mother Bona, like every woman, was attached to the house, to the household, to the land, to the children, and of course was more worried about the well-being of the family, the home. That is why Raiko now more often remembered his mother, her warmth and care, repeated her words and thoughts. We usually remembered our parents and relatives on the way, when the events of the day had already been discussed, when business conversations had been exhausted. What are my old people doing? Sometimes sighing, one of the partisans would ask as if unexpectedly. Doing what? They go to the police station three times a day to check in the lists specially made for them. They endure humiliation from every man in a police uniform. The only joy for them was the good news from our detachment, which came to them in the distant lands where they were sent. Sometimes our short letters reached them, which only mothers can understand. When we were passing through the Radov field, Raiko stopped, raised his hands in a theatrical gesture, and began to recite a long poem. I felt that he wanted to get away from the memories of his loved ones, he recited, trying to become stern and imperturbable again. There were times when we ran into an ambush or a random gunshot broke the silence. Reiko never panicked. Where did this short, skinny guy draw his strength from? On February 12, we returned to Jarlopsi again. We spent the night at one of our yotaks, and early in the morning we called Zakari Taskov. He had already prepared the youth to be sent to the detachment. In the evening, the youth were to gather near the Twikov Koshas. The preparation, however, did not remain a secret. Realizing that the hours of legal life were numbered, the youth began to worry. Some of them were sentimental. Some devoted their secret to their parents. Others confided it to their loved ones. In the evening, a noticeable revival began in the village. We collected socks, mittens, finished knitting sweaters, sewed warm clothes. The work was increasing and increasing. Only Zachary and Bogdan Ivanov knew our apartment. Other comrades did not know that we were in the village. Our stay here had to be kept strictly secret, otherwise everyone would certainly come to us, and then we would have to reveal ourselves and our yataks. At the appointed hour of departure the farewell began in the crooked alleys of the village. Some of them were seen off by their sisters and mothers, while others tried to be alone with their beloved girls for a moment. Some did not hold back tears, others remained cheerful. Promises, oaths of loyalty, be brave, come spring, we'll come to you. If you're so brave, let's go now. We will manage till spring without you. Hmm, answered the boys jokingly, going to Triktkov's cow sheds. Only Reiko Todorov and Boris Mitov were hesitant. Boris pretended to be sick and did not leave the house at all. And Reiko, though he had said goodbye to his relatives and came to the appointed place, but something was pulling him back, and he mumbled that he had to bring a couch from Sofia, and frowning, waddled back, accompanied by the taunts of the boys. Wait, Raiko, aren't you thinking of getting married, that you are going to get a couch? No, he wants to bring it to the squad, otherwise what will he sleep on? His father probably never even smelled a couch. His father might have slept on a pile of beech leaves, but Raiko wants a couch. And Boris is sick, lying in a fever, eating without memory. So the young partisans parted with their cowardly comrades, and cheerful, in good spirits went to the place where harsh battles awaited them. Guys who had not yet graduated from gymnasium, they imagined partisan life beautiful romantic. They did not think about difficulties or looked at them through rose-colored glasses. They saw everything as beautiful. Difficulties harden the weak, in them the heroes grow up. A column of young partisans marched through the Sigrilov field. 
It was led by Reiko Tukov, followed by Levcho Blagove, Bogdan Ivanov, Vasil Dragomanov, Delcho Zakariev, Kala Mihailov, Milko Simov and Dimitar Trichkov, five paces apart. We walked in silence. The unwritten partisan law demanded silence and order. The snow crunching underfoot, stars twinkling in the sky, the moon shining, the February frost tingling their cheeks. The dream replaces the dream. A little time will pass, and each of them, grown up strong, will return to the village, will rise to the podium, and from the crowd will look at him loving eyes of the girl, and tears of joy and pride will wet her delicate cheek. That same night, the boys learned how the guerrillas move at short distances. They observed Tishav carefully looked at the bushes they passed, walked quickly without breaking the column. When we came to the Ermi River, I stopped the column and explained how to cross the bridge. Bogdan and Delcho were assigned to scout. First examine the area in front of the bridge, then cross the bridge and scout the other side. If there is no danger, give a signal, imitating the voice of a thrush. If there is danger, one will remain to observe and the other must certainly go back and notify the comrades. The young partisans followed the instructions exactly, checked carefully the terrain and signalled that the way is free. Here we parted, he and Raiko. Tukov went to the village of Kalna, and I stayed to fulfil some tasks in Vokov, Rayanopsi and Slishopsi. On the evening of February 15, the commander of the Gendarme Battalion in Trina gave his subordinates the following instruction. Search for Lubasimova, as well as other associates or helpers of the Slavcho Staminov couple. As for the village of Bohova, instructions will be given on the spot. Telef's police platoon, one scout, fifteen soldiers. On the next day in the morning a Remsist came to Milo Iosifov in the village of Slyshopsi and informed me as follows. Two trucks with police and gendarmerie have gone to Bokova on the highway. Luba was a neighbour of Aunt Bozana. She had neither father nor mother and lived alone in her grandfather's house, surrounded by ravines that filled with water in rainy weather. Luba often spent the night at Aunt Bajana's house and witnessed many of our visits and meetings. Sometimes she was in our camp in the Boz tract, in Duro Simov's Koshara, and in other places. In a word, if she let it slip to the police, there could be great trouble. Luba was thin and tall, a very young girl with big beautiful eyes. She captivated the most prominent boys in the whole neighbourhood, and for Mirno, my cousin from the village of Slyfsi, a guy with a poetic soul, she became Evelina Holt. Now Luba was less conspicuous by her appearance, but she became richer spiritually. It would be wrong to leave Lyuba aside after she had been initiated into many of our secrets, so we included her in the Remsis group. Here she was to receive a battle hardening. We began to hold youth meetings in her house. We entrusted her with the distribution of our leaflets, partisan songs, and left her valuable materials for safekeeping. That is why the news that the police and the gendarmerie had gone to Bokova was very unpleasant news for us. I immediately thought of the meeting that had been held in her house two days before, and of the leaflets we had given her, which she had hidden behind the mirror hanging on the wall. Had she put them away somewhere else or not, it really bothered me. And if the police found them, Auntie Bojana and Baijiro, and the whole party and Remsist organization would be caught. I gave Milo the password I had agreed upon with Jurosimov in case of need, and asked him to go to Bochova immediately. It had been several hours since Miller had left home, and it was no more than a two-hour walk to Bocheva and back. His tardiness bothered me even more when I was informed that the cars had turned back and were headed for Trine. At last Myla came in. He was pale and could barely speak. Oh, oh, I was scared, he said. My legs were shaking, I could hardly walk. When I met them on the road, my legs were chopped off with an axe. Did you have time to do anything? They arrested her before I even got to the village. Luba's arrest was very mysterious and dangerous for us. She could fail many members of the youth organization of the village and also Auntie Boshana, our irreplaceable Yataka. At that time we believed that the reason for Luba's arrest was a leaflet with a partisan song found in her yard. The reality was that the police went to Bohova having a signal from someone about Luba's activities. Once at the Oakley office in Trine, Luba was immediately subjected to a severe beating. The most experienced local investigators from the regional police department were called in. Luba could barely stand on her feet, but she did not give anyone away. From Trine, Luba was taken to Sofia. The police there used more sophisticated methods, 
believing that it was easier to obtain information of interest not by beatings, but by imaginary goodwill. After much persuasion, the policeman Pramatarov managed to get Luba to agree to become his employee, and even agreed on the method by which she would give him information about the partisans. Then she was released, having two police agents assigned to her for communication, who were disguised in military uniforms and enrolled in the Gendarme Department of Stoichev, located in the village of Zabul near Bohova. The fascists gained nothing from this. Luba did not give them the information, and they, fearing to fall into our hands, hurried to arrest her again and kept her in prison until September 9. At that time, the Minister of the Interior was changed. Turovsky was replaced by Doko Hristov, followed by a change of the Okali governor and the chief of police in Trine. Instead of Dragilov, the former Social Democrat Sredko Nikolov was appointed. A retired teacher from Trine Okali, an insignificant person who did not prove himself in the political life of the Okali, a noticeable progress of reaction. As soon as the fascist bourgeoisie gets into trouble, it puts the Social Democrats in the foreground as its trusted men. Kocho Baikushev's place was given to his cousin Tatbitko Baikushev, who had been transferred here from Sofia, and Kocho Baikushev was appointed Okoli chief of police in the town of Dupnitsa. Such changes were all over the country. The replacement of Gabrovsky by Hristov had no significance for the Bulgarian people, because both the latter and the Drugoi were equally cruel to them and equally loyal to Hitler and the gang of his Bulgarian followers. At first, Docho Hristov tried to be cunning. He pretended to be a Democrat, tried to explain the causes of the partisan movement by the inaccurate actions of the administration on the ground. For this purpose, he sent his agitators all over the country. Kosta Ivanov, a big businessman from the village of Kostrasovsi, came to Trinska Okulya. He transmitted wherever possible the allegedly authentic words of Dr. Hristov that Dragulov and Baikushev had been fired for their bad attitude towards the population, as a result of which the partisan detachment had emerged and was growing. He predicted a change of other persons and promised the leaders of the resistance any service, good living conditions and oblivion of their former anti-state activities. When we learned of the arrival of the government missionary, we immediately rushed in his footsteps, but he, having gotten wind of what awaited him, hurried away to Sofia. The appointment of the new Minister of the Interior was marked by the creation of the so-called Gendarmerie, special troops to fight the partisans. The government, believing that the police and army were unable to cope with the resistance of the people, formed a special Gendarmerie to which the most qualified executioners of the people were carefully selected. It was almost impossible for communists and their sympathizers to penetrate there, the officers were picked from vicious enemies of the people, mercilessly cruel, without conscience or honour, where a gendarme's foot treads, grass does not grow, was the popular saying. Lieutenant Colonel Stoichev, an old merchant from Samakov, a thug who had shown his zeal in suppressing the September uprising of 1923, was appointed to replace Colonel Tekeliev in Trine. The battalion he now led was augmented with soldiers and officers who were reliable supporters of the fascist government. In addition to the battalion, the 5th Cavalry Squadron and several artillery and mortar batteries were transferred to the city from Bresnik. Arriving in the town, Stoichev made a statement that he would exterminate all partisans and jataks and turn their houses into ashes. This was no joke. He really showed himself to be a consummate spewer, but despite the unheard of and unprecedented cruelty that accompanied any operation, Stoichev could not destroy the partisans and jataks. Their houses were burning and the ranks of partisans and yataks were constantly growing. During his last stay in Sofia in early February, Delcho arranged with Gocho Gopin for a meeting in Trine. This circumstance, as well as the need to transfer weapons to the Shavdar detachment operating north of Sofia, forced Delcho and I to return immediately to our neighbourhood. With the arrival of Georgi Grigorov in the detachment, the party political work in the Okali improved to a certain extent. This was facilitated not only by his experience, but also by his knowledge of the cadres. However, because he, without taking any precautions, let himself be arrested and did not show up for the meeting in Sofia, we received him a little coldly. For the same reason, we did not immediately entrust him with the leadership of the party organizations of the Okolia, entrusting him for some time with the work of an instructor. The activities of Georgi Avramov, who came to us, played a great role in the activation of the partisan movement in our area and in strengthening the influence of the party. We, partisans, and the population by Pesho was little known, 
But now in the joint struggle, we were able to get to know this fiery revolutionary, whose life is very instructive. We knew about him only from the words of Vlado Trichkov. A teacher by profession, Vlado Trichkov told us, Merce, he is connected with the party with his whole life. Georgi Abramov was one of the most active participants in the struggle, so he was often persecuted by the authorities and left without work. And when he realized that he could no longer earn his living in Bulgaria, he left for Czechoslovakia. The desire to study did not leave him for a moment, and he enrolled in the Faculty of Forestry. But the restless spirit of a revolutionary did not put up with Czechoslovak reaction, so he was expelled from the country. Returning to Bulgaria, he graduated from the university with great difficulty, which only a true communist could overcome. During the whole period of his studies, he never for a moment ceased his party work. After graduation, Comrade Avramov went to work in the Razlozeskoye forestry. At the same time, he was elected secretary of the district party organization, but soon he had to go underground because of a failure in the organization. Taking into account his business qualities, the Central Committee of the party appointed Avramov as the first secretary of the Sofia District Committee, where he worked under the leadership of Stank Dimitrov. During this time, he became even more experienced and acquired valuable qualities of a communist. The ability to quickly establish communication with the masses, sociability, responsiveness, perseverance, humor. Georgi Avramov fell into the clutches of the police more than once. He was tortured, tried, thrown into the gloomy walls, but each time he became more and more firm and remained faithful to his party. When partisan shots reached the Haskovo camp, Georgi spent whole nights thinking about how to escape from the fascist trap. And then one day he, together with several comrades, found himself in Sofia and once again placed himself at the disposal of the party. We listen to the words of comrade Vlado Trikov, who surely gave an accurate characterization of Bai Pesho, and were happy that such people, rich in life and party experience, were coming to us. We knew then that Bai Pesho would come to us as a commissioner of the Sofia District Committee. All the time he was working here, we were constantly learning from him. He was an example to us of a fine man and communist. At one of the meetings, in the presence of comrades Vlado Trichkov, Zatko Georgiev, Densho Georgi Grigorov, Georgi Avramov and Delcho. I gave brief information about the progress of mobilization in the villages where Rancho and I had visited, told about the difficulties accompanying our work. On the basis of this, it was decided to include comrades Georgi Avramov and Georgi Grigorov in the agitation and outreach work, and wherever hesitation or unnecessary theorizing to delay mobilization until more favorable times would be noticed in the future, to be more persistent and, if necessary, to apply party sanctions. At the same meeting it was decided to replace the deceased Dimitar Tarkov with Nikola Lazov as battalion commander, and to keep Gekko Nedelikak as commissar. Myro and Iljo complemented each other. The former was a bit slow and the latter, on the contrary, energetic, quick-witted and quick to react to everything. Both of them showed themselves well during the long campaign in February, gaining high confidence not only in the command of the detachment, but also in all the guerrillas. This time, besides Raiko and me, Georgi Avramov, Georgi Grigorov and Delcho went to the Trine district. Delcho, as a man who now worked exclusively on the military line, was tasked with organizing the transfer of weapons to the detachment Chebdar. It was most convenient to do this by car or cart. Nikolai Nikolchev from the village of Byzantsi, our uncle Kolo, was assigned to help him. His house was also convenient for meeting with Gocho Gopin. Therefore, directly from Kalna, we went to Byzantsi. Zdravko Georgiev, the chief of staff of the zone, stayed with Vedo Trikov. He came here to organize the supply of weapons to the other units in the zone. The squad stayed with him. The fighters needed rest, and the sick needed some time to get back on their feet. When we arrived in Byzantsi, we discussed with Uncle Kolo first the question of meeting Comrade Gocho Gopin, and afterwards the question of transferring weapons. Both of these communications Uncle Kolo accepted without any objection. What is there to say? What kind of communists would we be if we had to be begged, he said, and thus put an end to further talk. Now it remained to deliver the weapons and to agree on a password with the comrades who would receive them. Before dawn the whole group moved to another house, and Timko, the son of Uncle Kolo, was sent to fetch Gopin, who carried out our errand properly. It was not yet dark, and Comrade Gopin was already at our place. Satisfied that he had escaped from the fascist clutches, he said, 
I've never felt such joy, comrades, until now. Now these bastards won't have the pleasure of chasing me, now I'll hunt them down. That same night Gocho Gopin and Delcho went to Vadedo Trikov, and the others, as agreed, went to the village of Turoxi. It was necessary to overcome the opportunism of Dimitar Toshev and at any cost to snatch the guys from there, about whom it was known that they had expressed a desire to go to the partisans. We had just crossed the highway from trying to Zabelski Inn when the headlights of a car column shone from the town. One, two, three, seven cars. They were moving at a close distance from each other and approaching us quickly. It was obvious that the police and the gendarmerie were taking a new action against the population. At first we thought of turning to Georgi Gotsev, a young man, a member of the party organization of the builders, who had once attended the illegal meetings in Sofia. He had given every assistance to the revolutionary movement before and was always ready to carry out any task. On the way, however, we changed our decision and went first to Dimitar Tashev's house. He received us, as always, with his usual coldness, but this did not prevent us from starting a serious conversation with him. This time it was easier for me. Two others, Georgi Grigorov and Bai Pesho, turned against Toshev's opportunist views, who considered the partisan movement an adventure. Toshev's arguments that the party and the RMs were losing too many of their members in the armed struggle. That these sacrifices were not justified by anything, that the guerrilla movement was not yet a mass movement, and that in general the time had not yet come for the development of a mass movement, were calmly and consistently defeated as inhuman, anti-party and opportunist. We proved to Tashev that the Red Army has helped and will help the peoples in their liberation struggle against fascism, but it would be a crime to wait lightly for its hand and count only on its help. Freedom, hmm, said the Baipesho, years won in a severe struggle. And the expansion of the guerrilla movement is only possible when the whole nation rises up and joins the struggle against fascism. There are no seasons in the struggle, it is waged at any time, and if you want to know, hmm, he added, winter is the most favourable time of year for guerrilla action. Tushiv felt that his theory was untenable, but he couldn't say otherwise because he had to cover his fear and unwillingness to leave his cows, sheep and chickens with something. When we told him that all those whom he had brought up and taught communism were coming to us, that he would fall low in the eyes of his pupils, being a deserter at the most important moment, his wife Radka intervened. Mitko, if indeed all your students are leaving, after all, the police will arrest you on the first day. It is better to die as a partisan than to die at the hands of the fascists without any struggle. Such a death would dishonor us all. If you like being a partisan, go on your own. Why are you sending me? He answered. His wife was silent, but in her silence one could feel the deepest offense that the closest person had inflicted on her. Before dawn we went to Georgi Gotsev's house with the whole group. Having agreed with him on the hour and place of the gathering of the youth, we sent him to Arso Rashev to inform him of the party's decision, according to which he should come to us immediately. There were no customers in Rashev's bookstore. Gotsev approached him and informed him of our decision. Arso was embarrassed. Up to now he had easily rejected our proposals, because they were transmitted from distant villages and were not so categorical. But now, what to answer now? When the partisans are a few kilometers from the city, when Gocho Gopin and Georgi Grigorov have gone to the detachment, when the party calls even non-partisans, when, yes, key women go to the partisans? What can the secretary of the Okoli party committee say now? Shouldn't he be the one to set an example? Arso spat, according to his usual habit, turned his head, shrugged his shoulders and said, it would be nice to leave, but these bastards are watching my every move. They won't let me step. On the other hand, they are very cruel to the relatives of partisans. They burned the houses in Yelopsi, and tomorrow they'll burn mine. And it's very cold now. The snow is deep. The gendarmerie will take us alive. I wish we'd post- Rashev's refusal could not but cause us universal indignation. Hey, is this the way the secretary of the party committee should pursue the party line? Said by Pesho angrily. What is such a communist for the party if he leaves it in a decisive battle? Let such communists go to hell. He finished and waved his hand. When Gotsev returned from the city, he was sent to Toshev for the third time. They wanted to hear from him the final decision whether he would go or not. When Gotsev informed him of our assignment, he... No. 
Didn't you realize that I'm not crazy and don't want to become an adventurer? Mitko, Georgie, was upset to tears. In an hour we are all leaving. Will you who taught us to love the party and sacrifice yourself for everything, change the party discipline? What will people think of such a teacher whose words are at odds with his deeds? You realize that tomorrow you'll be arrested. Only you will be blamed for the fact that we left in the detachment. Tashev thought, looked at the ceiling and finally said, All right, I'll go. I'll join you behind the outskirts. I'll leave the cows, the sheep, the chickens, I'll leave everything. From today I am becoming an adventurer like you. Tashev's answer, though irritated, pleased Georgie, and he came running to inform us at once. Sir, people began to gather. Under the elm tree near the school, all those who were leaving had already gathered. Only one, Ivan Histov, had not come. He still hadn't decided to leave his bride. He promised to leave another time. But afterwards we learned that he had gone to Stara Zagora just to be away from the partisans. Together with the whole group of new partisans, Dimitar Tushev. Georgi Gotsev, brothers Bon and Peter Zhivkov, Grigor Antonov, Petko Tasev, Toma Markov. We went to the village of Zabel. We stayed in the house of Techi Joe and Borislav, who sympathized with us. Their mother, Grandmother Marika, was also there. Well, Grandmother Marika, by Pesho jokingly addressed her, we have come to take your sons too. Look how many people are leaving for the partisans. They can't stay here to be laughed at by the people. What are you doing, son? The old woman began, not understanding the joke. They're sick, and there's no one to look after me. Here, and pretending to be a fool, she untied one end of a black handkerchief, take the money, but don't touch the children. In her hand were two folded bills of twenty lever. Very well, grandmother, said Baipesho. We'll leave them to you now, but next time we'll take them, and the money put it for yourself. Sonia and Borislav stood by the stove, hushed, and only waited for us to leave to recover from the embarrassment. While we were talking to the old woman, two boys, I Tekto, Sef and Toma Markov, ran away. They returned to their home village and the next day went to the police to confess. Because of their betrayal, the police burned down old Marika's house and arrested her sons. In Zabalbaj Peshko, Georgie and Raiko separated from us and went to Redovo. After Radovo, they were to go around other villages to take new partisans there, and I led the group to Kalna. The road to Kalna passed through Miloslav Zepsi, and then through Dishinkladnets. When we left Miloslav Zepsi and climbed the ridge leading to Dishinkladnets, we found on the trampled snow traces of iron-soled boots, suspecting that the same policemen and gendarmes who had met us yesterday had passed in front of us. I sent out a long-range guard. We were not prepared for battle. All our armament consisted of one automatic rifle, a carbine and a pistol, and most of the young partisans had never handled a gun. We had to sneak stealthily to the base. Then we discovered other tracks. In the snow to the right of the path, we could see the imprints of the duffel bags and butts of a whole column. Evidently there had been a halt at this spot. There was now no doubt that no less than a company of gendarmes and policemen had passed in front of us. Having crossed the frontier line and descended to Dishin Claydens, the sentinel signalled that the enemy column was not far from us. It was necessary to deviate from the direct road to Kalna and linger in the southern mahala of the village of Krivina Jabuka. In this mahala I knew Stojan, who had connected me with Milik in August 1943. But he was absent now. He had long been a partisan, and only his wife remained in the house. At first she was frightened, but when I reminded her of our old meeting with Stojan, she immediately called some man who was filling in for him. He immediately went to Tumba and Kalpa's place. When we were left alone, Tasev, addressing me, said joking, You're leading us to certain death. Can't you see that a little more and we will fall into the fist? Fist in his lingo meant ambush, trap, danger. We could, but we won't. That's why we have patrols and scouts. It's still a gamble. But let's see where our boots get to. We've been without bread for the first day. Let's see what happens next. No, you're not the fool. I, I left a barn full of white flour, a whole jar of cow butter, 50 chickens, almost 500 eggs, so that all this would be eaten by these monsters, and I would look at someone else's pie and drool. Tushev meant the pie left on the table from yesterday's feast. Today was the beginning of the fast. We could have had a serious fight with him, if it hadn't been for the boy who entered the room, probably for some purpose, but looked at us. 
same say, comrade, he turned to Dimitar Toshev, who was astonishingly tall. How many meters are you? One ninety ten, Toshev answered angrily. Well and well, so you are not up to two meters. Mia seriously replied the puzzled guy, not understanding the play on words. Our guys rolled with laughter. Tusiv told stories in a very original way. He used words and expressions that made his speech interesting, varied and often caused Homeric laughter. The words fist, opaki, sap sarap, wolfhounds, adventure, adventurism were constantly in search. Therefore, his jokes and subtle irony, sometimes expressing a wrong understanding of the struggle, were not always taken seriously. While we were standing in Krivena Jabuka, the police surrounded Kalna on all sides. According to the decision of the Trinian fascist leaders, it was to be completely destroyed. To this end, Stoichev's Gendarme Battalion launched an offensive in three directions, from Dysenkladens, Spanos and Strezimirovsi. However, the population of Kalna did not remain passive. Having learned about the fascist blockade, everyone who could carry a weapon ran into the forest and opened fire against the brutalized gendarmes. The peasants could no longer tolerate this constant bullying. They had no flour, no fat, no chickens, and not even calves to speak of. They were doomed to agonizing hunger. That is why their hatred for the fascist police and gendarmerie reached its highest point. Behind every stone, behind every bush, the enemy was in danger. Toward evening, we learned that the gendarmerie had left the village and went there. The school and other buildings that had been the pride of Kalna had turned into ashes. Women and children cried around them, who had nowhere to go in those cold days of February. Without shelter, they were doomed to certain death. Joining us, Bai Simo, one of the active anti-fascists of the village, came up to us. He too had returned from the forest. Ah, uh, Comrade Slavcho, look what your Bulgarians have done. They've emptied everything. These Bulgarians do the same to the inhabitants of their villages. That's the nature of fascists, Bai Simo. Partisans have nothing to do with them. I know, Slavcho, I know. But it's painful, painful. What did we do to deserve this fate? What are we guilty of? We don't want a foreign occupation, that's all. And we won't tolerate it. We'll fight while our heart beats. Afterward, he leaned over and whispered to me. This morning I had Gosho and a well-dressed man, a stranger. They were asleep and had not yet had time to dress when the alarm was sounded. A little more and they would have fallen into the hands of the fascists. Our group followed in the footsteps of Delcho and Gopin. We caught up with them in Sierra Ne Trava. The squad was here too. Most of the comrades were healthy and everyone, partisans and peasants, told us about the last battle. Here, instead of Major Davies, who had died, we found Captain Thompson, a lean, tall, slender officer of about thirty-five. Thompson knew Bulgarian very well, was sociable and a good conversationalist. Bulgarian, he said, he had learned from his Slavic mother. Thompson memorized partisan songs with great diligence, translated them into English, and kept a detailed diary of our operations. Compared to Major Davis, Thompson looked more sympathetic, spoke warmly about the revolutionary past of the Bulgarian people. The success of the Red Army, the guerrilla movement, condemned the delay in opening a second front on the part of England and the United States, in general tried to leave us an impression of himself as an advanced man. Once, when we were having lunch, just the three of us, Vlado Hrikov, Thompson and I, Comrade Vado Hitchkov, asked, How do you feel about the communists? Natraus in Bitont. Although I am not a communist myself, I have respect for the communists. They are honest people, sincere, defending the interests of their class. Immediately after our arrival in Sierra Natrave, we began to resolve some organizational issues. On the agenda was the selection of the new party leadership of Tierne Okokia. Everyone was finally convinced that Comrade Arso Rashev could not lead the organization with the required determination. The new committee was formed in the following composition. Secretary Georgi Grigorov, committee members, Dencho Dyurov, Arso Rashev, Stoyan Yakimov, Petr Stanimirov, and Tetsa Todorova. Arso Rashev, together with Stoyan Yakimov, was responsible for the work in the city, while Tetsa was responsible for the Okali RMC organization. Stoyan Yakimov was the liaison between them and the city at that time, but it was becoming more and more difficult to meet with him every day. It was necessary to look for another way out. After the re-election of the Okolian leadership, I had to unite the work in Trinska, Brzezijic, Radomir, Saribrod, Bozilegrad, Godex, and Sofia Rural Okoli. 
Deltro was included in the headquarters of the zone, and he was assigned the job of moving weapons from Trinskoy to the other Okolias. One morning Vlado Trichkov informed me that he had decided to go to Sofia and asked me to accompany him some part of the way. I prepared myself, gave instructions to the remaining comrades, and we set out on our journey. Comrade Trichkov entrusted the negotiations with the English mission to Gocho Gopin, while Georgi Avramov, Todor Madanov, Slatan, Georgi Grigorov and a few other partisans were to go to Bresnik Okolia, where Todor and Momshil prepared the transfer to the detachment of a large group of new partisans. For this purpose, Badge Peshko, Todor and Momkail were to meet me in the village of Raznik to clarify the details of this operation. We walked with Vado Trichkov for several days. He was a rather heavy man, moving slowly, and the bad weather did not hinder him either. The ground had softened, mud stuck to his shoes, and his legs became as heavy as logs. Lado Trichkov was walking through the fields and cursing. He cursed everything, fascism, slush, melted snow, which was the culprit of this sticky Bresnik mud. Hey, it's no road for me at my age, he said. If we had some vodka and a good snack here, that would be another matter. So Slavcho, let's finish fascism quickly. And I answered him that vodka was of little use, that it poisoned a man, exhausted him, and in general I talked about everything I had learned in the society of Tita Totors, to whose precepts I remained faithful. I did not dare to say that alcohol clouds the consciousness. In front of me was an old, inexperienced fighter who had devoted his whole life to the struggle for the happiness of the people. It's all bad for those who can't drink. After such an argument I fell silent. Vlado was a man of experience who had experienced a lot, seen a lot and suffered a lot, and indeed why would one deprive such a man of the small pleasure of a drink or two or a cigarette? But I was apparently very young to realise this. Comrade Vado Trichkov especially admired the hospitality of the people of our region. This admiration came not only from the fact that the peasants treated us to the best food almost the whole way, but because he had known the Tryon population for a long time and very well. There was never a time when a stranger came to a village in Trier and was not invited to spend the night and have dinner. The Trentians were poor themselves, but if a guest came to them, they would chop the head of the last chicken, as long as they did not disgrace themselves in front of him. This hospitality can probably be explained by their life of hardship and wandering. They have repeatedly experienced that unpleasant feeling that people who are tired on the road, hungry, thrown by fate into foreign lands and have no place to lay their heads if they are not called home. I learned Vlado Trikov's real name only in Bresnik. When Alexander Tinkov saw Vlado, he was so confused that he forgot both the conspiracy and everything else. Only then did I realize that by Vlado was by Ivan, that it was for him that a year ago we had collected money and food so that he would not starve to death in the concentration camp, which made him even more pleasant and close to me. Now I understood his old ties to our region. After all, he was born here. In Rasnika we parted with Bavi Vlado. Ivanka Peshiva, the daughter of Grandmother Erina from Sofia, accompanied him further, while I stayed in the village. Here I had to wait for my comrades from the detachment and meet a new group of underground fighters from the capital. In the village of Foxhainai, in Greek Macedonia, on December 23, 1943, there was an unprecedented celebration. It was organized in honor of the Bulgarian soldiers of the under 15th border subunit, who together with their commander Daiko Petrov, on the 14th of the same month defected to the partisans and formed a partisan battalion named after Hristo Botin. In addition to the Macedonian and Greek partisans, the celebration was attended by more than 10,000 peasants who came from neighboring villages. This day turned into a celebration of brotherhood and militant friendship between the Bulgarian people and other Balkan peoples who had been pitted against each other by their rulers for many years, forcing them to shed blood in brutal wars. That is why it is difficult to describe the enthusiasm and enthusiasm of the people who came to this new for the Balkan peoples. Exciting and heartfelt celebration. There were 75 soldiers in the battalion. Of them, 49 soldiers from the Anna 15th border subpart, 14 from the 3A 14th border subpart and 12 Macedonians from near Gedjeli who joined the battalion to strengthen friendship and solidarity with the Bulgarian partisans. The fighters were divided into two chetas of 37 men each. Each cheeta consisted of three wings. The leadership of the battalion consisted of a commander, a political commissar, respective deputies and an intendant. 
Daiko Petrov was appointed commander and Trifon Balkansky was appointed political commissar. After its formation before going to Bulgaria, the battalion was part of the 2nd Macedonian People's Liberation Brigade. The newly formed partisan unit had a solid armament. Four machine guns with 3,000 rounds of ammunition each, 97 rifles with 100 rounds of ammunition each and many grenades. Besides weapons, the soldiers took a lot of products with them. Nine tons of flour, six tons of rice, 600 kilograms of fats, 950 kilograms of sugar. These products satisfied the food needs of the guerrillas for a long time. From December to February, the battalion operated in the area of Kozhuk, Payak Mountain and Kaimak Shalan. Deep snow and heavy frosts did not prevent the experienced soldiers, now partisans, from terrifying the police, gendarmerie and occupation. During this time, the boat FC attacked an army unit transferred to their area, crossed the railroad line between the town of Gevgelji and the station of Nagordi, and shelled the guard of Gevgelji, and as part of the 2nd Macedonian Brigade participated in the destruction of several German echelons, in the elimination of two fascist posts with radio stations in the area of Dimekapia, and in many other operations. These actions of the partisans of the 1st Partisan Battalion for some time interrupted the line through which the Nazis supplied their troops in Greece and the Aegean Islands. In response to the courageous actions of the Botevsi fascists, put a large number of police and soldiers against them. Near the village of Livadia, guerrillas fought with almost 200 soldiers and policemen, defeated them, took 40 people prisoner, along with weapons and many other trophies. At the end of January 1944, the battalion together with the 2nd Macedonian Brigade was in the village of Storsko. Comrade Boyan Bolgarinov, the representative of the Central Committee of the BKP in Macedonia, who at that time was in charge of interaction between the Bulgarian and Macedonian partisans, also arrived here. On his instructions, the battalion was to redeploy to Bulgarian territory. A long and difficult crossing lay ahead. At that time, another battalion was formed from the Red Army men who had escaped from captivity, a large number of Greek partisans, Poles, Italians and Moroccans who came over to our side. It was a joint struggle of representatives of different peoples in the name of internationalism and fraternal cooperation. The Botipti partisans of the International Battalion and the 2nd Macedonian Brigade parted cordially with the local population and set out on a difficult march. Each detachment was accompanied by an experienced guide from the local population. Partisans had accurate information about the enemy's movements, were supplied with large supplies of food. They crossed the Vardar, passed 20 kilometers from Thessaloniki, and from the area of Kukusha headed north to the mountain range Belasitsa. The situation in Greece and Yugoslavia was almost identical. Both countries were suffocating under the oppression of occupation, so wherever the partisans came, they were welcomed with joy and provided with shelter. Not a single traitor was found during the whole journey. It was especially dear to the locals that Bulgarians, ennobled by Hitler, who promised to turn their country into a great power, were also fighting against fascism. Belisitse met the partisans unfriendly. Snow blizzards instantly covered all the paths, mercilessly pounced on the tired fighters. The frost was brutal. Horses, faithful friends of the guerrillas, drowned in snowdrifts. Blood was flowing from their nostrils. To get the horses out of the snowdrifts, the guerrillas covered the way with their blankets. After Belisitsa, the detachments went to the equally snowy and harsh mountains of Ograshden and Plechkovitsa. Here, new trials were added. The enemy pursued them on their heels. Many times the partisans had to take the fight and throw the enemy away in order to continue the way forward. In these decisive fights, 11 people broke away from the column. All to one became victims of the enemy, thus passed dozens of kilometers. On Koziak Gora met with Serbian partisans. Together with them fought brutal battles with Drazivists. In a bayonet attack, Bulgarian, Serbian and Macedonian partisans threw back almost 700 people Drazivists, capturing dozens of enemies. Thus, irreconcilably in a Botiv-like manner, with heavy fighting, they were approaching the borders of the homeland. At the beginning of March, the local committee of the Patriotic Front in Sierra Ne Trava was informed by a special courier that a partisan battalion made up of Bulgarian soldiers had arrived in the village from Macedonia and was looking for a connection with the Trerene detachment. This was the Hristo Botev battalion under the command of Daiko Petrov. 
The committee immediately reported this news to the peasants and many welcoming people came out to the central street of the village. There were Myro and Baiza carriers, who had come to escort the newly arrived comrades to Dobro Polje, where the train detachment would be stationed. We awaited the arrival of the Botevs with great impatience and excitement, because we all knew about their numerous combat operations. Comrade Boyan Borgaranov also marched with the battalion. The activities of the Botev battalion were closely connected with Bolgaranov, who had participated in the partisan struggle back in 1923, 1925, and passed on all his rich experience to the young Botev men. This experience could now be used by us, the partisans of Trane Trava. The streets of Sirne Trava were filled with the enthusiastic poems of the immortal Botev. The locals warmly welcomed the fit partisans, gave them a rich lunch and rejoiced with all their hearts at the Young People's Liberation Army, which was growing stronger by the day and competing with the long-established Serist Army. After lunch, the Botevs set out for Dobro Pole. The Centen informed comrades Gocho Gopin, Zavko Georgiev and Densho of the battalion's approach. The fighters of the battalion named after Nevsky ran through the deep snow to meet their comrades in arms and kiss them. New plans and new hopes were growing in their hearts. Having arrived in the village, the Botevsi immediately organized a combat guard as prescribed by the statute. The soldiers came to their commanders tightened, reported, and after receiving the task each repeated it, and the commander could judge whether it was correctly or incorrectly understood. All this made a great impression on the partisans of the Levski battalion, and they began to adopt the best from their comrades with great diligence. From that moment, the two battalions merged into one whole, one unit capable of performing very difficult combat tasks. The unification of the two battalions turned into a rapturous celebration, the crowning event of which was the oath of office taken by the new partisans who had just joined the unit. This took place before the eyes of men, women and girls who came from the surrounding villages to celebrate. Boyan Bolgarinov's speech made a strong impression. Having spent several years in the Soviet Union, having gone through all stages of the underground struggle in Bulgaria, having experienced all the difficulties of partisan life, he spoke as an older comrade, father and commander. Comrades, Bolgarinov addressed the partisans and peasants. Today our hearts are overflowing with joy and delight. From now on, a perfectly armed and perfectly prepared battalion will start operating in the Tryon district, to participating in dozens of battles with the enemy. It has not lost a single battle. The soldiers of the newly arrived Tristo Botev battalion will fight together with you. Although the battalion was formed only recently, its history is rich and very instructive. First, Bolgarinov told about comrades Daiko Petrov and Trifon Bolkansky, the commander and political commissar of the battalion, and then told the story of the battalion's creation. Bolkansky joined the Yugoslav partisans back in 1942. An old member of the RMs, he and his comrade Georgi Gelishev escaped from a fascist barracks and ended up in the partisans. When Trifon and Georgi got a good fighting temper, the Yugoslavs sent them to Macedonia so that, on the one hand, they could pass on their experience and, on the other hand, show the Macedonian population that the Bulgarian people had also risen to the struggle and were fighting for their national independence together with the Macedonian people. In all the battles they set an example of courage and fearlessness. Chomsky died as a hero and Balkansky was appointed commissar of the 3rd Macedonian Army. One day he learned that the commander of the May 15th border, Sabaria, Lieutenant Daiko Petrov, was a man of progressive views, and he immediately tried to contact him. The attempt was successful. Daiko Petrov was a teacher by profession, mobilized into the Tsarist army and sent to Gebeli. After his arrival in the town, he established contact with the Okali party committee and began to work actively among the soldiers. For them, he was a comrade, teacher and commander. He shared the same fate with them. He taught them and enlightened them, as he had previously taught children in the villages of Sokolovsi and Sirinsa in Asinovgradska. He led them as an experienced and beloved commander. The windows in his room were lit until late at night. It became not only a club where they read fiction and scientific literature, but also a place where they discussed various topical domestic and international issues. He spent whole nights with the soldiers, enriching his knowledge and experience looking for forms of more effective political propaganda to arm his subordinates with hatred of fascism, he succeeded easily, because he was the first to take up every difficult task and was equally demanding of himself and others. Next to his commander, 
always supporting him were the members of the RM's Enko Draginsky, Manui Dimov, Prodan Delchev, Viljo Georgiev, Matei Shenkov, Viljo Ivanov Tenev, Tocho Totov, Angel Gospodinov, Nikola Senov, and Nikola Tonchev. They became agitators, explained the events taking place, and convinced the soldiers that the partisan struggle was the struggle of the whole nation, that it was just and would certainly succeed. Gradually, the circle of true patriots expanded. Remsistov managed to convince most of the soldiers, and so on December 14, 1943, Daiko Petrov, instead of going on leave granted to him by his commander, informed the soldiers of his decision to join the ranks of the partisans. Unprecedented excitement and enthusiasm swept over the soldiers when the partisans arrived in the evening, and the whole unit, having seized weapons and ammunition, embarked on the difficult path of partisan struggle. When Bolkansky, you said Bolgaranov, Ivetetu brought me to the village of Nyta, where there was a whole company of soldiers who voluntarily, consciously moved to us, to our people, at the call of our glorious party, I was greatly excited. Such excitement I had not felt for a long time. Here, I said to myself, the final decomposition of the fascist army is coming. He experienced the same excitement at the general soldiers' meeting, at which the question of voluntary enlistment in the ranks of the People's Liberation Army was raised. Here the future partisans swore to serve faithfully and faithfully not to the German Tsar, but to their people. A long and glorious way passed the battalion named after Christo Botev. The Botis will never forget their first baptism of fire in the battle against the fascists on December 26 near Konsko, nor the great friendship with the Macedonian partisans from the battalion of Ovcharov, together with whom they crushed the enemy nor the heroic death of Shuisky, nor the attack on the garrison in Gevgili, and the elimination of several dozen German soldiers in the villages of Oshani and Duguntsi. The village of Lgunsi in one day three times passed into the hands of the enemy and into the hands of the Botevsi. The picture of stealthy passage through the German positions near Doiran Lake, overcoming snowdrifts on the top of Tumba in Belasitsa, saving horses, ammunition and radio station remained in their memory forever. The Botevs will remember with a sense of their duty to their homeland, how in the pouring rain and through deep snows they overcame the mountains Ograshden and Plachkovitsa without complaint, how barefoot, exhausted by hunger and sleeplessness, they walked hundreds of kilometers to reach our unit, how they fought a bloody battle in the village of Petian, how they forced the river Bregalnica, and of course they will remember their comrades who died in these battles. Comrade Bolgarinov also told about the fierce battles on Koziak Gora, near the Pisinja River, about the glorious journey of the battalion until it arrived in Sierra Netraba. Those were unforgettable, heroic days, you, said Bolgarinov. At the end of the speech, the representative of the Central Committee gave an overview of the international and internal situation, spoke about the actions of the Red Army, about which the old communist always spoke with exceptional love and respect. The fascists, said Bolgarinov, will not stand it. Their forces are melting away, while the power of the Soviet Union is constantly growing, and with it, its international prestige. There is no other country in the world whose prestige during the war has increased as much as that of the Soviet Union and its army. And this is because the Soviet Union is waging a liberating just war, because it stands in the front ranks of all the nations fighting against the hated fascism. Speaking about the partisan movement in Bulgaria, Bolgarinov noted that it should be expanded more and more to master the territory, to create large partisan units. Bolgarinov fervently advised the partisans to seek support in the people, to explain to them the goals of our struggle, and to prepare them for a decisive battle. All our attention, finished Bolgarinov, must be turned to those areas where guerrillas have never yet set foot. The radius of our actions must be significantly increased. We must pass through Radomir, Brzeziak, Sarabrod, Bosiligrad, and Kustendil Lokali, contact there with active detachments, and where there are none, create them. This is our primary task. I wish you success, comrades. Let this wonderful weapon, which you proudly carry, be covered with national glory. After the celebration, with the help of Bulgarinov and Zudravko Georgiev, the command of the detachment was formed, which now consisted of two battalions, the battalion named after Hristo Botev, and the battalion named after Basil Levsky. Due to the new tasks assigned to the detachment, some changes were made in the personnel as well. New partisans from Radomir and Trina Okoli were enrolled in the Levsky battalion, 
and Milko Toshev and Goraz Dimitrov were appointed deputy commissars in the Botev battalion. Having reorganized, Balgarinov gathered the responsible comrades from the detachment and clarified the tasks of the upcoming campaign. The general direction of action was defined as the Bulgarian Yugoslav border south of the village of Lasina. The aim of the campaign was to unite with the Bosiligrad and Kustendil detachments for joint political and military actions. The start of the campaign was mid march In accordance with the instructions of Vlado Trikov and Bolgarinov, a group of 12 men under the command of Zlatan remained in the Tryon district. Its duties included the reception and training of underground fighters from Sofia, Radomir, Kustendil and Bresnik Okolia, who were continuously arriving in the detachment and carrying out operations and various sabotage activities in the Okilia, so that the fascist administration would not have the opportunity to come to its senses. At the same time, it was decided that Bogarinov and Zadravko Georgiev should move to Sofia. Slavcho, Radomirsky and Evlogia again were put in charge of their transfer. In connection with the rapid growth of partisan units and the continuous increase of pressure on the fascist government to break with Hitler's Germany and to form a new government of the home front, in the second half of March in the headquarters of the 5th Bulgarian Army, located in Yugoslavia, a secret plan was drawn up under the code name Raiden. This plan provided for concentrated actions in the area of Kiane Trava, where, according to fascist information, were the main forces of the Yugoslav and Bulgarian partisans of southwestern Bulgaria. The purpose of these actions was to destroy the partisans and to devastate the entire area, so that no new units could be formed there in the future. The commander of the 14th Infantry Division, Colonel Nedev, was appointed to lead this entire action. Seven infantry battalions from the 5th Army, three infantry battalions from the Occupation Corps, two divisions of the 1st Consolidated Cavalry Brigade, two squads of reconnaissance planes, 50 trucks, artillery and mortar units, and all the police and gendarmerie units of the Skopla and Sofia regions were placed at his disposal. All these forces and means were organized into four military police detachments. The Trinsky Detachment under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Tumanov, the Nish Detachment under the command of Colonel Lazarev, the Moravsky Detachment under the command of Colonel Beshisky, and the Vlasny Detachment under the command of Colonel Popov. These detachments numbered about 8,000 men. According to the plan, the fighting was to begin on March 15 and on March 20. The individual tasks of the detachments corresponded to the general plan of the command to create a ring of encirclement in the RNA Trave area, for which purpose the detachments reached the initial lines at night, carefully camouflaged. Despite the measures taken, the concentration of fascist units could not remain hidden from our reconnaissance, in which the entire population participated. During the preparatory period, the commander of the 5th Army, General Boydev, announced a number of strict orders and restrictions. He forbade the peaceful population to go beyond the encirclement ring, ordered to search all houses and koshers, and suspicious persons to be immediately handed over to the police. Houses and temporary houses, where the inhabitants showed the slightest resistance to be burned, people who did not obey his orders to be shot. At the same time, the order drew serious attention to the fact that by means of this action the authority of the Bulgarian state, government and army, must be restored at all costs. Those who had shown themselves in arson and murder would be rewarded, it would be treated with the full rigour of wartime laws. This action, on which the fascist authorities pinned great hopes, began three days late and ended in complete failure. The fascist command not only failed to fulfil its task and destroy the partisans, but even failed to inflict any tangible losses on the partisans. As always, the fascists justified their failures by fantastically exaggerating the size of the partisan. They reported to the high command that in the area of Sierne Trambe, the total number of Bulgarian and Yugoslav partisans is 1,500 well-armed fighters, when in fact the partisans there were no more than 300 people. Detecting the concentration of large enemy forces and revealing the plan of the fascist command, the headquarters of the detachment without delay gave the order to leave the Kronotrava area. The Yugoslav partisans also received the same order. On March 16, all Yugoslav and Bulgarian partisans left the village of Dobropolje and set out along the predetermined routes, the Triane detachment to Bosiligrad and the Yugoslavs to Sedulica. Leaving the area of Siane Trava, our detachment had several fights with the police and the army, 
but managed to force our way through and headed for Bosley Grad. We were to take possession of this town and concentrated for battle in the village of Krenushtitsa, but due to treachery the strike was not realized. Having learned about the movement of the detachment, the Bosiligrad and Kustendil police of about 300 men, reinforced by an infantry battalion, approached Kronoshtitsa and began to surround the village from the northwest and east. This indicated that the enemy had accurate information about the location of the detachment in the village. In an effort to capture the village in a pincer, two police platoons approached the western outskirts, where one of the even battalions of the Hrista Botev Battalion under the command of Kosta Dimitrov was located. Thanks to the vigilance of the guards, the wits of the commander and the self-possession of the fighters, all the nearby heights and extreme houses were quickly occupied, so that the advance force of the police detachment came under our fire. The enemy turned around and tried to attack, but, met by rifle and machine gun fire, retreated and began a deep detour from the southwest. However, the bypass was not accomplished before evening. Attempts by the infantry battalion to penetrate the village Takti remained unsuccessful. The personnel of our battalion's guard opened fire with four machine guns and forced the enemy to lie down in deep snow in an unfavorable position far from the detachment. In the afternoon a heavy snowstorm began, and under cover of darkness and storm, overcoming deep drifts, the Garenes reached the summit of Sornuk and took a more convenient position. Since the enemy did not dare to attack the guerrillas on the summit, Densho gave the order to abandon Kronuk and withdraw to the village of Zaidol. On this day, the brothers Slavsho and Mailiko Lazov, and the votive men Georgi Stoichev and Naseto showed themselves in the battle. They followed not only the movement of the enemy, but, so to speak, even his breath timely revealing his intentions. According to the preliminary plan of the command of detachment in the village of Zaidol, it was necessary to disarm the public guard, created by the Minister of Interior Dojo Hristov, to stock up on food, and after that with a guide to advance to the village of Politinsi, where, according to reliable information, a group of partisans of the Kustendil detachment was operating. When they approached the village, Prodan's men, who were on the advance guard, encountered an armed group on the outskirts of the village and dispersed it. In the centre of the village, guerrillas were waiting for a new ambush. A fierce firefight ensued, in which the headman was severely wounded and the public guard was defeated. The headman was sentenced to death and the sentence was carried out. Having learned by bitter experience in the village of Kronushtaitse, where several peasants from the public guard managed to escape and reported everything to the police, the partisans blocked all the exits in Zaidol. After dinner, the detachment set out on a new heavy march. This trek was complicated not only by the fact that the way was difficult to pass, but also by the fact that the population of this area, not yet freed from the old nationalist animosity, was now drugged by the fascist authorities, who managed to turn them against us with lies and slander, claiming that the partisans wanted to subjugate this region to Peter, the former Serbian king. The politically backward population met us with hostility, and in some cases armed groups created by the fascists fought against us. With the help of a local guide who knew all the paths in the area, the partisans headed for Kustendil to smash the prison and free the prisoners, but due to the heavily rugged and difficult terrain, deep snow and limited time, we had to change the direction of travel. As they approached the Bosilegrad, Kustendil Highway, the partisan patrol encountered an ambush that was hiding in Bezukas near the road. After a short battle, the detachment defeated the ambush. When the guerrillas learned that all roads were blocked by police and troops, they had no choice but to go to Politins, see through the village of Nishni Uino. This way was very dangerous because there were many police and soldiers in the village. Everyone in the detachment understood the importance of this crossing and therefore moved quickly, quietly and in an organized manner. Neither deep snow nor severe frost could break the iron will of the partisans. They overcame all the difficulties and at dawn safely approached the outskirts of the village Politinsi. Even during the transition, the headquarters made a plan to block the village and the implementation of the operation assigned to separate groups. Three groups were to encircle the village, and the fourth knew to seize the centre and prepare the cantonment of fighters. Since the Botevis were dressed in soldiers' uniforms, the peasants thought that they were regular troops following in the footsteps of the Kustendil detachment. For this reason, the peasants behaved rather aloof at first, but when they realized that it was the people's army, they immediately softened during the transition because of the constant harassment. 
the partisans had no opportunity to carry out propaganda and outreach work. Only in palatancy were favourable conditions created, and our entire apparatus engaged in agitation, which was facilitated by the still preserved in this village traditions of the Tesniatskogi period of the history of our party and a strong party organisation. With the help of a forester, the partisans established a telephone connection with the village of Nizhny Uino, where a proven anti-fascist worked on the telephone connection, who, risking the life of his family, continuously informed the detachment about the advance of police and military units. This enabled the detachment's command to take effective action in time against any surprises. By noon, Dencho and Daiko had received information that there were guerrillas somewhere in the village. They, just like the peasants, mistook the detachment for a military unit and hid. However, the news that it was not the Tsar's army, but the People's Army, quickly reached the Kustendil comrades. They left the hayloft in which they had been hiding and met the command of our detachment. After a brief negotiation, having understood the purpose of the trick detachment's campaign, the local partisans hurriedly set out on the trail of the Kustian Dill detachment, commanded by Dragon Kortensky, to convey to him our wishes for joint action. The next day, both detachments met in the village of Brest. The Kustian Dill detachment consisted of 12 men, among whom were Kiro Bogoslovsky and Ivan Jeknov. Here we also established contact with Vasil Dukatsky, the leader of the youth underground of the Bosiligrad district. All these comrades went with the Trinsky detachment to take weapons from our warehouse and then return back to their neighbourhoods. It became more fun. Some knew the terrain well in Kustendil Okolia, others in Trine Okolia, and others in Bosiligrad Okolia. In the village of Brest, the peasants welcomed the partisans very cordially, supplied them with food for the long journey and gathered for a rally, at which the commanders of both detachments made a speech. Everything that was said at the rally, the peasants heard for the first time and therefore were deeply excited. The event did not go so smoothly in the village of Zlogosh in Kustendil district, where, as in many other villages, a public guard was established, headed by the most zealous Sankovists. Therefore, even as Dencho, Dicho, Balkansky and Kortensky approached the village, they allocated groups to organise ambushes, and the main forces began to enter the village quickly. Before they knew it, 27 mercenaries were disarmed. The telephone line was cut, the equipment at the post station once ruined, and the community's archive burned. When all was safely over, Densho gave the order to leave the village. The sentries moved towards Yushi village, followed by the main forces at a certain distance. At the same time, the headquarters received information that the police and troops were regrouping on a very large scale, and that there were police units in the area of Ushi and other surrounding villages. In the situation created, the command gave orders that the intendants should go into one or two mahals, collect foodstuffs and wait for the detachment. They did so. The soldiers were given a modest breakfast, had a snack, rested and by midnight, bypassing Ushi, headed for the village of Sredorek, located northwest of the Treklian police base. At Sredorek, the detachment arrived by nine o'clock. Being out of danger, the partisans felt freer and sang. The students of the pro-gymnasium were in class at that time. Hearing our songs, they crowded around the trench and ran out into the courtyard, loudly greeting the people's liberation troops. Long live the partisans, long live the partisans, came from all sides. The adults got excited too. They took food and water to the street and, without fear of the police, met and saw off the partisans as the dearest and most honoured guests. The rapid advance of the detachment and the sabotage carried out by me, Georgi Avramov and Radenko Vidinsky in the village of Kosovo, confused the maps of the police and troops, preventing them from catching up with us and imposing an unfavourable battle. The troops, following the detachment, withdrew from the river and headed for Kosovo, where of course they no longer found the detachment, and then moved towards Lower Melna to cross the road there somewhere near Bloody Stone. An important height that controlled the roads between the villages of Shipkovica, Lower Melna, Kaisli and Kolunitsa, and put us in a stalemate. The enemy's idea of occupying Bloody Stone and setting up large ambushes in several places was quite well thought out tactically, but Densho, Daikonsky and Kortensky countered it with their own plan. They decided to get ahead of the enemy and ambush, the main routes leading to Bloody Stone and Shipkovica. Of great importance for the realization of this plan was the geographical location of Shiptawika and the good attitude of the peasants towards the partisans. 
Ship Kovica occupied the southeastern part of the ridge stretching from Bloody Stone and blocking the road to Lower Melna from Bozica and Bozigrad, and the Ship Kovicans were completely on our side. For the fact that we returned to them the bread requisitioned by the fascists, they paid you with hospitality and were ready to go into the fire for our sake. The head of the column was Dencho. With great effort fighters overcame the deep snow, if in the fall the distance from Dragojikinsev to Shipkovica was covered in one hour. Now it was not even two hours. All the ravines through which they had to pass were filled to the top, and huge snowdrifts had grown on the bends. The column approached Shipkovica when it was already dark. People had already gone home. Some were having supper, others were having merry gatherings. The low houses were barely visible from under the snow. They merged with the drifts, and only the black smoke showed their location. The partisan sang. The cheerful sounds spread through the village. Dogs barked. Doors and windows began to open. Hmm. Partisans are coming. Shouted in the courtyards of women and children. Let's go to... Soon old men and young people appeared at the gates of the houses. Good evening. Good evening. Densho greeted left and right. Welcome. Welcome. Answered the peasants. Have you got the requisitioned bread? Densho joked. No, no. Several women answered in unison. Since the fall, these dogs have not entered the village. Thank you, nobody touches us any more. We live freely. At that time, the children from the fighting group surrounded Densho. Uncle Densho, the pioneers are ready to receive their assignments, reported the oldest. Oh, you, my dear scouts, let me kiss you first, and then I'll give you a task. He embraced the whole group with his long arms, kissed who in the cheeks, who in the forehead, and then gave a task to each. The children moved out of the way and joined the column. The peasants invited five or six people to dinner, who could eat as much as they could. Comrades had dinner and rested, but in each house a watch was organized. The peasants themselves took care of security and reconnaissance. In case of necessity, they agreed on a signal and a place of gathering. The night passed quietly. Nothing was heard anywhere, no shooting, no hum of engines. This, of course, did not mean that nothing would happen at all. The headquarters was about to receive information from Dragojitsin Sev and Lower Melna, and it was not late. Just as we expected, the enemy is active. It is moving in two directions, reported Daiko Petrov to the commander of the detachment. Fighters need to urgently go into ambushes. Those alert the fighters, one of them to occupy the ridge between Kaishli and Shipkovitsa, and the other to block the road from the Dragovichin TV side. First of all, organize ambushes, Densho ordered, rubbing his forehead sleepily. The squad will head for Bloodstone. If all goes well, we'll go to Kolunica. The position the battalions had taken was about three kilometers long, which made it difficult to defend. The command of the detachment realized from where to expect the greatest onslaught, and accordingly the main forces were concentrated on the line Lower Melna, Bloody Stone. Here was Daiko Petrov himself, who was entrusted with the leadership of combat operations in this area. The enemy approached our positions very cautiously. He had already fallen into partisan traps more than once, and therefore sent his reconnaissance far ahead. 